Good morning and welcome <coughs> to the first of two public witness hearings being held today for the non-tribal uh, programs under the jurisdiction of the Interior Environment Appropriations Subcommittee. I'm pleased to be joined by our ranking member, David Joyce of Ohio, our Vo Vice Chair, Congresswoman Shelley Pingree of Maine, and my um, other colleagues, Mr. Stewart and Mr. Amande. Um, as chair of the subcommittee, uh, I am, I want you to know, I'm really excited to bring back this important tradition of public witness days. While we have continued to hold uh, annual public witness hearings for America's uh, Native American Indians and Alaska Natives, this is the first public witness hearing dedicated to non-tribal programs held by this subcommittee since March of 2015. And today we'll hear from more than 40 witnesses and it's composed of a diverse range of partners, including public, nonprofit organizations, state and local agencies. And this testimony is gonna cover a diverse range of topics related to the jurisdiction of this committee, the arts and the humanities, the environment, public lands, and wildlife. And I'm ready to learn more about all of your priorities, and I look forward to the discussions on these issues, because I believe it will help inform us to develop the 2020 Appropriations Bill. Now before I turn to Mr. Joyce, I'd like to cover the hearing logistics. Each witness will have five minutes to present testimony, and we'll be using a timer to keep track of the time. When the light turns yellow, the witness will have one minute <laughs> remaining to conclude his or her remarks. <laughs> when the light blinks red, I will lightly tap the gavel. I mean lightly. <laughs> so the next witness can begin. And I know five minutes can go so very fast, um, but we need to be fair. We need to get through a lot of testimony today. As I said, I'm very excited about it. And as I mentioned to some of you earlier, your written testimony will be submitted for the record. And I've read all of it, so I'm, I'm really uh, excited to hear um, our question and answer part, which will also be part of um, what we will do at the end of the whole panel's testimony. And I'd like to remind those of you in the committee uh, the hearing room about the rules. We prohibit the use of cameras and audio equipment during the hearing with, uh, unless you're presented with house pre uh, press credentials. So other than that, no pictures, uh, please. Uh, this morning's hearing concludes. We will adjourn and then we'll reconvene at 1245 for the afternoon hearing. And with that, I am very happy and honored to yield to my friend, Mr. Joyce, for his remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and thank you for calling this important hearing uh, to get input from the public on a wide array of programs under the subcommittee's jurisdiction. I look forward to working with you in the days and weeks ahead to do what we can to evaluate the effectiveness of these programs and to make the difficult but necessary choices among competing priorities. Since we have a full day of uh, testimony ahead of us, I'm glad to yield back at this time. Great. Um, Ms. Pingree, any remarks? Absolutely not. <clears throat> All right. All right. Well, I'm going to turn to our first panel now uh, covering the arts. Mr. Lynch, uh, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, you are recognized for five minutes, sir. Thank you so much. Good morning, and uh, let me just say Chair McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce and Co-Chair of the Congressional Arts Caucus, uh, Congresswoman Pingree, uh, and members of the subcommittee, I, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of federal funding for the National Endowment for the Arts at no less than $167.5 million for fiscal year uh, 2020. That's a $12.5 million increase over fiscal year 2019 funding. The arts are exploding across America, bringing uh, human, social, and economic benefits. And I thank this committee for helping to lead that effort. This committee has been uh, in the forefront of, of that effort. Um, Americans for the Arts works to advance the arts and arts education in America, uh, representing and serving the more than 5,000 local arts agencies in every state. And together uh, with those agencies, we work to ensure that every American uh, has access to the transformative power of the arts. And it's been my honor to be there for 34 years. Um, I know that I speak for the entire arts community in our appreciation for the bipartisan work from this committee and Congress in appropriating the additional $2 million last year and an increase in 2018 as well. Um, I thank you for that. It has made a huge difference. 
These consecutive years of incremental funding uh, enhance the National Endowment for the Arts investment in every single congressional district uh, in our country. And according to the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, this now contributes $764 billion um, uh, to, uh, from the arts and culture industry in America, 4.2% uh, uh, of the annual gross domestic product, bigger than tourism itself, amazingly. Um, the uh, nation's arts and culture industry supports 4.9 million direct jobs and yields a $21 billion trade surplus for our country. So this investment is a good deal for America. Every National Endowment for the Arts grant dollar leverages also at least $9 in private and other public funds generating more than 500 million in matching support. And this leveraging power is the, the chief value, I think, uh, far surpasses the required non-federal ma uh, match of one-to-one. -one. Um, it's uh, unique to this um, uh, industry and very valuable to the growth of our industry. For fiscal year 2020, we hope that the National Endowment for the Arts will receive funding at the same level as the recent high point of 167.5 million, which Congress appropriated on a bipartisan, bipartisan basis back in fiscal year 2010. So a while back, we'd love to see it return. Um, we estimate that uh, this $12.5 million in increase based on current NEA programming would provide first an increase for direct endowment grants by about $6 million. Secondly, an increase of $4 million to the NEA's state partnership agreement, which would result in about 2,000 additional state grants across the country. And with the uh, National Endowment for the Arts estimation of nine to one return, uh, each direct grant dollar um, uh, will leverage an additional 40, 40 million in non-federal matching support. So um, that is the, the main thing that we're looking for and that the arts community, many of my colleagues here, um, are, are, are looking for uh, in that growth. But today I'd also like to highlight one very important National Endowment for the Arts initiative. That is the Creative Forces Program. Uh, an increase in funding for the National Endowment for the Arts is vital in order to sustain and expand important work that serves the needs of military service members and veterans, many of whom um, are just around this table I've heard um, today, um, but uh, many of whom out there in the community have been diagnosed with uh, traumatic brain injury and psychological and physical health conditions. Much of this work is being supported through targeted programs such as the National Endowment for, for the Arts Creative Forces Military Healing Arts Network, which we're proud to, uh, is administered through a cooperative agreement with Americans for the Arts, as well as many community arts engagement programs receiving federal grants with state and local arts agencies. The Creative Forces program uh, currently has been expanded, uh, with your help, to 11 clinical sites and utilizes creative arts therapists who are integrated into interdisciplinary treatment teams providing art therapy, music therapy, dance and movement therapy, and creative writing instruction for service members. In 2018, more than 16,000 patient encounters took place and over 3,000 new patients were served. Uh, this work is being documented and networked through uh, the Americans for the Arts National Initiative for Arts and Health in the Military. And several ad, uh, examples uh, that uh, I have here are administered and take place in your districts or districts of members here. So the Arts Bellum Foundation in St. Paul, Minnesota is one with uh, research-based art therapy programs for veterans and their families. The Vet Arts Project in Akron, Ohio, um, specializing in storytelling and focusing on women. The, the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, which uses glass blowing and hot shop uh, with its uh, uh, hot shop heroes healing with fire program. And the Reno Veterans uh, Photo Group in Reno, Nevada, um, focusing on photography and lighting and, um, and uh, fr framing and printing. So an awful lot um, is happening. Uh, 85% of military patients say art therapy is helpful to their healing and uh, military patients consistently rate art therapy among the top four treatments out of more than 40 health interventions offered. Shortly, you'll hear from uh, uh, about this life-changing program from the gentleman next to me, and I won't go into his credentials. You'll hear about it uh, themselves, but it's an honor to be sitting here with him. So thank you for your consideration and support of at least $167.5 million for the NEA uh, in the fiscal year 2020 budget. And we stand ready 
to uh, assist and remain focused on getting the endowments fully funded again in the coming months. Thank you. Um, Mr. Christopher Stone, Master Gunnery Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, retired. Welcome home. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair McCollum, <coughs> Ranking Member Joyce, uh, who's also a fellow Ohioan, uh, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in front of you today in support of federal funding for the National Demo for the Arts. Uh, I'd like to echo Mr. Lynch's comments of uh, a budget line of no more than 167.5 uh, million for FY20, with a 12.5 million increase over FY 2019 funding. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I am a retired Marine Master Gunnery Sergeant who has served with multiple conventional and special forces units as an explosive ordnance disposal technician. Uh, deploying six times to Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as multiple locations in Africa, Kosovo, Macedonia, Macedonia, and other Central Command locations in the Middle East uh, over the course of my 24-year career. I have also served uh, in, in these halls as a Congressional Fellow uh, for then uh, Chairman of the House Committee on Veteran Affairs, Jeff Miller, uh, as, a, as a Wounded Warrior Fellow on his committee working on veterans legislation and oversight of the Veterans Affairs Department in 2013. Today, I am testifying at the invitation of the American Art Therapy Association, a 501c3 not-for-profit, nonpartisan, professional and educational organization dedicated to the growth and development of art therapy profession. I appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment on the budget request for the NEA, specifically in support of creative arts therapies and community arts engagement programs like Creative Forces, the NEA Military Healing Arts Network, a partnership of the NEA, the Departments of Defense and Veteran Affairs, and state and local arts agencies that serve the special needs of military service members and veterans with traumatic brain injury and psychological health conditions, as well as their family and caregivers. Creative arts therapies, including art therapy and music therapy, and community arts engagement programs have completely changed uh, how I view therapeutic treatment. The use of creative arts therapies as part of an integrative approach to healing my combat injuries helped me move towards more of a whole person uh, approach to therapy and helped me succeed. Uh, I, f I fully believe that no single form of therapy uh, is the be-all and end-all. One individual uh, may, not, may or may not respond well to traditional forms of therapy, but will accelerate greatly in his or her healing when creative arts therapy, as in my case, is applied in concert with more traditional therapies. A mask-making exercise is typically done at one of the first exercises in the art therapy program at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence in Walter Reed. Uh, as many of you can attest in seeing uh, the National Geographic uh, special that was done in their magazine, as well as uh, the TED Med uh, speech that was done by the, by the creative arts therapist there, Melissa Walker. Uh, I can attest to the mixed emotions that can be felt during this mass making exercise. Uh, guilt, fear, self-loathing, uh, self-doubt at first, and then while moving through the making of the mask, feelings of exhilaration, freedom, resolution, and accomplishment can start to, uh, accomplishment can start to emerge. I know that it helped show the way for me as it pertained to how I personally viewed myself. Uh, normal on the outside, uh, kind of a demon and a little bit broken on the inside. Uh, I also feel that this nonverbal tool allows the members to expose themselves in a safe and controlled setting with an art therapist without having to belabor long talk therapy sessions in order to draw out the key pieces that a member needs to help needs help dealing with, while creating a very visceral trust experience and exercise with the art therapist and the member in a very non-judgmental way. Creative self self expression has long been a form of healing throughout cultures around the world, and we're fortunate that the creative arts therapies are being more widely accepted in the medical community today. The readily apparent benefits of increased confidence, mental acuity, physical dexterity, improved self-worth, and decrease in depression have all been wonderfully positive aspects to me that were and are derived from art therapy. <clears throat> However, the, the incidental positive consequences of art therapy and creative forces, as well as engaging with traditional non-military communities, such as local art communities, have been equally beneficial to me. Some of these positive consequences for me have been increased interaction with other people, um, as in the case today. Uh, a much greater appreciation of people that have never served and what their lives and opinions look like, a healthier overall appreciation for human life and perspectives, as well as a deepened and renewed commitment to my fellow service members to the advocacy of art therapy. I can state unequivocally that art therapy has helped me become a better human, husband, father, and friend. I can also state without a doubt that art therapy has helped save my life. As a testament to how creative art therapies have positively affected me and how I in interact with the world, I founded the first community-based arts program to partner with the James A. Haley VA in Tampa, Florida uh, at the Maureen Arts Center in St. Petersburg called Operation Art of Valor. Uh, much like the West Coast version, Hot Shop Heroes, uh, this collaborative project between the NEA, the VA, and the local arts community teaches the art of glass blowing to veterans and military members free of charge. Uh, this program wouldn't be possible without funding opportunities from the NEA's military and veteran-focused program, Creative Forces and their guidance and resource education have been invalu invaluable to me so I can continue to serve. 
I sincerely hope the subcommittee and Congress as a whole will continue to support creative art therapies and access to more community-based arts engagement programs for service members, veterans, their families, and caregivers by increasing the NEA's funding for FY 2020 to at least $167.5 million. I once again thank you all for allowing me to testify here this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Ford Bell, um, who, in full disclosure, is from Minnesota. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Chairwoman McCollum, thanks to you and Ranking Member Joyce uh, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Ford Bell and I am the immediate, sorry, immediate past president and CEO of the American Alliance of Museums here in Washington. AAM represents all types of museums from art to natural history, museums to zoos, and I'm especially delighted to testify before you today, which is Museums Advocacy Day on Capitol Hill. I'm here to request the subcommittee provide at least $167.5 million each in fiscal year 2020 funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as sufficient funding for the Smithsonian Institution. We also request your support for the Historic Preservation Fund, including at least $60 million for State Historic Preservation Offices, $20 million for Tribal Historic Preservation Offices, $15 million for competitive grants to preserve the sites and stories of the Civil Rights Movement, and $15 million for the Save America's Treasures program. Museums are economic engines and job creators. U.S. museums support more than 726,000 jobs annually and pump $50 billion annually into our economy. Their ec economic activity generates more than $12 billion in tax revenue, one-third of it going to state and local governments. The financial impact museums have on Minnesota's economy is $917 million each year, including 13,781 jobs. For Ohio, it's $1.5 billion impact, supporting almost 26,000 jobs. This impact is not limited to cities. More than 25% of museums are in rural areas. The import of these data is not the numbers alone, but the point that museums give back tremendously to their communities in numerous ways, including economically. The federal funding for NEA, NEH, and other government programs does not stay in Washington, D.C., but goes back to communities across the nation, and it is leveraged many times over by private philanthropy and by state and local investments. Increasing investments in these agencies and programs will enhance museums' work to enrich their communities and preserve our many heritages. My testimony today focuses on the NEH and NEA. <clears throat> the Humanities Endowment supports museums as institutions of lifelong learning and exploration and as keepers of our cultural, historical, and scientific heritages that can foster critical dialogues on challenging issues of our time. Many of NEH's divisions and offices support museums, and we applaud the Office of Challenge Grants for offering matching grants to support much-needed infrastructure projects at museums. Here's one example of how NEH funding was used to support museums' work in your communities. The Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, Minnesota received an exceptional $600,000 award to implement a traveling exhibition, website, and public programs examining the history of World War I and its impact on America that opened at the museum in 2017 and is now traveling nationally. The Art Endowment's grants to museums help them exhibit, preserve, and interpret visual material through exhibitions, residencies, publications, commissions, conservation, documentation, and public programs. Since 2010, the NEA has collaborated with Blue Star Families uh, at, and the U.S. Department of Defense on Blue Star Museums, a really great program which provides free museum admission to active duty military and their families all summer long. In 2018, more than 2,000 museums in all 50 states participated, reaching on average more than 900,000 military families. In 2018, the NEA provided more than 100 awards directly to museums, totaling over $3.73 million. Here is just one example of how NEA funding was used to support museums' work in your communities. The Cleveland Museum of Art in Cleveland, Ohio, received $40,000 in 2017 to support a research project designed to answer questions on how best to use new visitor engagement technology to help the museum build and sustain new audiences in the community. In addition to these direct grants, NEA's Arts and Artifacts Indemnity, Pro Indemnity Program allows museums of all types to apply for federal indemnity for major exhibitions, saving them as much as $30 million in insurance costs every year and making many more exhibitions available to the public, all at virtually no cost to the American taxpayer. In closing, I highlight a recent national poll showing 95% of voters would approve lawmakers acting to support museums, and 96% want federal funding for museums to be maintained or increased. 
People love their museums, and our country is better because of them. I invite members of the subcommittee and your staff to attend our Museum's Advocacy Day reception from 5 to 7 p.m. this evening in the Capitol Visitor Center Cafe. I appreciate the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Bell. Ms. Uh, Jessica Under Unger. Foundation of Advancement and Conservation. We're anxious to hear what you have to say. Okay. Well, Chair McCollum, uh, Ranking Member Joyce, members of the subcommittee, good morning and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, my name is Jessica Unger and I serve as Emergency Programs Coordinator at the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation, also known as the Foundation for the American Institute for Conservation. Um, I'm here today to testify on behalf of the National Humanities Al Alliance for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, firearms from the Civil War covered in mud sat on the banks of the Mississippi Gulf Coast in the days after Hurricane Katrina. Move this a little closer. Costumes, props, and programs from the famed Martha Graham Dance Company floated in their storm surge inundated storage room in the hours following Hurricane Sandy. And swirls of mold covered the walls from floor to ceiling of a Puerto Rican library in the weeks after Hurricane Maria. The sense of loss that accompanies disasters is acute. That sense is heightened when our collective cultural heritage is imperiled as well. We rely on objects to learn from past generations and to carry our own legacy into the future. Books, letters, records, photographs, film, works of art, whether located in our nation's great museums are in the cedar chest at home. Our tangible cultural heritage is found in objects that are at risk of decomposing. It is the job of cultural heritage conservators to slow down the processes of decay, working with museums, libraries, and archives collection staff to provide the best environmental conditions possible and perform treatments on objects as needed. Conservators are an impressive bunch. Uh, versed in art history, studio art, and chemistry, they go through rigorous training in order to do the essential work of preserving our cultural heritage. In my role at the Foundation for Advancement and Conservation, I work with a team of conservators and collections care professionals who volunteer their time and expertise to help collections affected by emergencies and disasters. This team, known as the National Heritage Responders, <coughs> have done incredible work to salvage items when it seemed that all was lost. The team's work has been consistently supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities. The agency has funded research projects and uh, have likewise informed response protocols and supportive innovative publications. NEH has likewise supported the deployments following major disaster events, uh, providing these volunteers with the equipment and resources needed for their success. National Heritage responders have a knowledge of materials on the molecular level that helps drive their decision-making processes. For example, while mold is a major threat to objects, collect to objects exposed to damp environments, somewhat items can actually be frozen in order to create a hostile setting for mold growth. These objects can later be thawed and dried. Research and development of techniques in this area have moved forward in leaps and bounds over the past several decades, and NEH has played an important role in supporting this response work. Although while having measures in place to effectively respond to disasters is essential, those activities don't take into account the full scope of a disaster cycle. Preparedness and mitigation require foresight, innovation, and cooperation. The Foundation for Advancement and Conservation manages a program called Alliance for Response, which aims to bring together collections professionals with emergency managers and first responders on the local level. These communities form cooperative disaster networks that work together to achieve collective goals. The network in Seattle has a mutual aid agreement in place to support each other during the big one. In Salt Lake City, the network has collaborated with state agencies to write an annex to the state's emergency plan that included cultural resources. And the network in Minneapolis, St. Paul, developed a guide to working with first responders. NEH has been supporting the work of Alliance for Response since 2010. The agency's investment in the program has allowed for the launch of new networks across the country and has provided resources for the existing networks, such as training opportunities. Collaborating on the local level is essential, as each region faces their own challenges in terms of natural hazards. Increasingly extreme weather patterns are changing these hazards as well. California institutions face an increased risk for wildfires, and uh, hurricanes gather more power over warmer water, threatening those in their path. Local networks are nimble in responding to these changing risks. NEH has, through their history of funding, recognized the importance of supporting collecting institutions as they prepare for, respond to, recover from emergencies and disasters, and the impact of these efforts is significant. When Hurricane Irma hit Florida in 2017, the Vizcaya Museum and Gardens in Miami, located on Biscayne Bay, suffered significant storm surge damage. However, just four months prior, the museum hosted an NEH-funded workshop on disaster response with the South Florida Alliance for Response Network. 
And after the storm, the museum's conservator knew to call the National Heritage Responders for assistance, which helped Vizcaya staff quickly stabilize the environment and minimize the impact of mold. Conservators and collections care professionals face significant challenges in protecting our cultural heritage for future generations. Uh, but there's ample evidence to show that the strategic funding uh, by the NEH has laid important groundwork, and there's still much work to be done. With increased funding, NEH can support the networking and training that are essential in protecting cultural heritage from emergencies and disasters. And this important work must continue to make sure that the human story is preserved. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you for the testimony. Um, we were reminded of how important our, our arts, our history, and our culture are, and we also learned some new um, new information here. I, I don't have any questions for the panel, uh, but before I move on, I would encourage uh, anyone who would like to go out to Walter Reed, we can arrange for that to happen through this committee. I'm also on the, on the defense committee. It is, it is absolutely amazing um, what's going on out there. So if you haven't had an opportunity and you'd like to do that, um, if a group of us would like to go together or something like that, we can, we can make that happen. So thank you all very much for your testimony. Mr. Joyce? I have no questions either, but I appreciate the offer to do that. Ms. Pingree? Uh, just briefly, thank you all for your testimony, and I look forward to a visit to Walter Reed. I've heard about the program before, and thank you for your testimony. That was very personal and very moving, so thank you. And um, thank you to Americans for the Arts. I'm looking forward to being the co-chair um, with my Republican colleague of the Arts Caucus and working with you, and I really appreciate all you do to um, advocate both for funding but all the activities around the arts and learned a lot about conservation there and of course thank you very much we have lots of tiny museums in Maine and we love them all so thank you <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Stewart Mr. Stewart could I ask you to turn on your microphone thank you <laughs> sorry we want to hear every word okay I'll start over <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to thank uh, the witnesses, but especially Christopher as a, as a veteran myself, as a family of veterans and with a family who's serving and deployed now, I think you bring up a point that is often overlooked. And that is we typically think of, uh, of veterans and those who you know, need a little help as we adjust coming home and the challenges that, that many face. Uh, there's a little bit of a box that we often put them in and this is outside of that box and it can be very effective, very cost efficient. And uh, we appreciate your efforts to highlight that. Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Madam Chair. And um, Mr. Stowe, I just want to um, say thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for testifying to the benefits of the Hot Shop Heroes program at mm -hmm. the Museum of Glass in Tacoma. It's probably one of the coolest hours I've had in this job was getting to visit with some of the vets who are participating in that program uh, who, uh, you know, I had m one of them say to me, you know, I, I learned how to break a bunch of stuff, and mm -hmm. this has been really cool to get to form a bunch of stuff and to create something. Uh, and as they spoke to the therapeutic benefits, it was incredibly powerful and highlights the importance of fighting for funding for the NEA. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I would just like to add, too, that Hot Shop Heroes and the partnership with Creative Forces, uh, their program was the temple that I used with, with Greg Owen out there at the, at the Tacoma Museum, and that's how we got our program started, was the collaboration between uh, both coasts through uh, the NEA and Creative Forces as the conduit. So thank you very much, sir. Mr. Amadei. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to, j just two things real quick. One is let's kind of take with a grain of salt my colleague from Utah's comments because he was in the Air Force, not the Marines. <laughs> <laughs> However, as, as a former Army guy, um, um, which I know isn't as good as, as, as where you hang from, but, but it was the best I could do under the circumstances. But I don't want to limit the hearings uh, and, and the value of your testimony to the fact that arts therapy could also be a very good treatment methodology for members of Congress, as well as those who have, who have your background. And with that, I will yield back, Madam Chair. I second that. Um, Ms. Was uh, Wasserman Coleman. I'm sorry I was late, I was delayed. I'm Glad that I heard as much as I have heard. And thank you for, thank you. Thank you for uh, coming before us. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I just want to um, uh, comment on, on something I thought was really important in the testimony that I heard today. And, and um, that is um, trends are up. They're up in our museums. They're up in our uh, cultural institutions. 
and people want to have the experience and the touch tones. And so I think that the fact that all four of you were here to talk about the importance of the match that we do through this committee uh, to uh, amplify the experience of healing, enjoying, creating, and sharing is so very important. So I thank you all. And Mr. Bell, thank you for the invite to, to the world that we're uh, to come to the uh, reception tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. As the next panel comes up, um, I would just like to, uh, for people in, um, who are, are here today, we mean no disrespect if you see members come uh, to and for uh, th this, this hearing as uh, there are other appropriation meetings taking place and some members will be speaking in committees or preparing for testimony on the floor. So. Um, thank you very, very much. The other thing I'm going to do is because we're all in this together, I'm going to share in introducing the panels. So Mr. Joyce and your team, get ready if you're here. Uh, Ms. Pingree is going to introduce our next uh, panel and um, lead that discussion. So uh, if our next panel would come forward. And Ms. Pingree, you can, um, they're right here. So Flor Delino. Flor Delino and Alexander. It's Tittle, Languidino, and Tittle. Languidino and Tittle. Mm -hmm. Languidino, Languidino. Okay, looks like we're reassembled. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, for giving me this opportunity. Hopefully, I will. Get your names correct, and we'll start with Pam Bro, the CEO of the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Thank you, Ms. Bro. Very correct. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the committee, thank you all for the invitation to deliver this testimony regarding federal appropriations for the National Endowment for the Arts. The National Assembly of State Arts Agencies, also known as NASA, is the organization that represents and serves the nation's 56 state and jurisdictional arts agencies. Today, I'm here to thank the members for their tremendous support for the National Endowment for the Arts and urge the committee to consider funding it at $167 million in fiscal year 2020, or to be in exact uh, tandem with my colleague, mm -hmm. 167.5. In the funding bill passed by Congress earlier this month, the subcommittee supported an increase of $2 million in funding for the agency. The states and NASA are extremely grateful for this, particularly given the administration's proposal to eliminate the agency. We recognize that committee members work together in a bipartisan matter to manner to support the NEA and its important contributions to our nature. As you look to the next budget, NASA hopes you will once again consider increasing funding for the NEA, which continues to make a substantial impact in communities throughout the U.S. Through its highly effective federal-state partnership, the NEA distributes 40% of its programmatic funds to state and regional arts agencies each year. The resulting $49.4 million in 2018 help to empower states and regions to address their unique priorities and serve far more constituents than federal funds alone could reach. The report accompanying last year's Consolidated Appropriations Act affirmed Congress support for this important partnership and the 40% allocation, and we sincerely thank the committee for this acknowledgement. State arts agencies use their share of NEA funds combined with funds from state legislatures to support approximately 22,000 grants to arts organizations, civic organizations, and schools in more than 4,500 communities across the U.S. 21% of state arts agency grant awards go to non-metropolitan areas, supporting programs that strengthen the civic and economic sustainability of rural America. 29% of state arts agency grant dollars go to arts education, fostering student success in and outside of school, as well as building the critical thinking, creativity, and communication skills necessary to meet the demands of today's competitive workforce. 
Congress continued support of the 40% formula is essential to state arts agencies, boosting their ability to ensure that the arts benefit all communities, regardless of wealth or geography. Should Congress support an increase for the NEA, state arts agencies will be in a position to expand their meaningful work to help communities thrive as fulfilling and productive places to live, conduct business, visit, and raise families. They will also maintain their commitment to engaging the public in decision-making about their programs, a hallmark of state arts agency service. NASA and states also applaud the NEA's many services to the country, including its leadership in developing the noteworthy program for military personnel and veterans. In partnership with the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, the NEA, of course, established Creative Forces, its military healing arts network, which now has 11 clinical sites in nine states for creative arts therapies. Proudly, state arts agencies now work with federal, state, and local partners to expand the reach of the program to benefit veteran and military family populations in community settings. Partners also continue to work in solidarity to help military personnel and veterans return to their homes, their missions, and their families whole, mentally fit, and emotionally ready for whatever comes next. And to this end, we certainly heard an eloquent and poignant earlier testimony that attests to these benefits. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. NASA sincerely appreciates Congress' strong bipartisan support for the National Endowment for the Arts and federal funding for the arts. We look forward to continuing to work productively with this committee, and we stand ready to serve as a resource to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Flordolino Logandino from the Park Square Theater. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chairman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee. It is my both an honor and a privilege to speak to you today in support of the National Endowment for the Arts, its mission to celebrate our nation's diverse cultural heritage. The public interactions that the NEA supports are necessary to our nation as they deepen our understanding of ourselves and our community, cultivate respect for our varied beliefs and values, and open us up to a wider world view. This is the work of the arts and the work that the arts does best. The experiences of my career have shown me how the arts as a public practice strengthens our society by engaging adults and by enhancing the understanding of the generations of diverse young people who comprise the future of our country and our world. Through my experiences in theater, I have seen people be inspired, change their personal viewpoints, and grow their communities. Personally, theater has enabled me to supplant the image of the Filipino as little brown brother that was found in my history textbooks as an energized, forward-looking with an energized, forward-looking sense of self. I am the artistic director of Park Square Theater, the largest producing theater in St. Paul, and the third largest in the Twin Cities region of Minnesota. We have over 3,000 subscribers, and more than 100,000 people see our shows every year. This the, uh, theater season is producing nine shows, and um, three shows as a part of our award-winning education program, which serves over 30,000 students annually. In a recent conversation with Mayor Melvin Carter, the first African-American mayor of St. Paul, he identified stories that highlight our differences to be of the utmost importance to building a thriving city. By sharing a multiplicity of perspectives, we connect and learn how from our seemingly dissimilar backgrounds, we actually have shared struggle, struggles and experiences. The support of the NEA is essential to our art making as it enables Park Square to share stories that might not otherwise be heard. This past summer, we received a $10,000 NEA Challenge America grant, which funded the world premiere of the Korean uh, drama addict's guide to losing her virginity by Hmong playwright Mei Li Yang. This play is a contemporary comedy about a Hmong Minnesota woman attempting to find love in order to, in order to rid herself of ghosts from the past. We co-produced this play with Theater Moo, an Asian American theater company in the Twin Cities. With the NEA's contribution, we funded talkback discussions with the artists, produced a series of panel discussions about contemporary Korean and Hmong culture, and offered pay-as-you-can tickets for the entire three-week three run, making performance ex performances accessible. 
The community response from this new play was overwhelming with the entire run being sold out after the first weekend. The NEA was important to the, su to the success by alleviating some of the financial risk involved in producing this new play and providing platforms for community engagement. In addition to our main stage adult pro programming, for over two decades, Park Square Theatre has had its, at its core its mission, the presentation of great literature to teenage audiences in Minnesota and neighboring states. With support from the NEA, these live presentations challenge teens with complex human situations and questions, stoke their intellects, and give them a window into different worlds by making literature human and immediate. This past fall, Park Square presented a, a Midsummer Night's Dream that featured Asian American actors in three of the lovers' roles. The response from the Asian American students was of amazement and joy as they were able to see representations of themselves as lovers, being strong, vulnerable, impetuous, and very, very silly. They saw the Asian American images on stage reflected back to them as their fullest selves of who they are, of what they could be in the future, could be in the future. These staging, stagings engender a sense of belonging in our society and community. Our core values at Park Square of inclusive casting allows our students the important opportunity to see themselves on stage. The ability to see oneself on stage and to see stories from one's own culture reflected is such a powerful experience, especially for people who are often denied complex representations of their identity. Theater has given me the opportunity to, opportunity to lift up um, and complicate representations of my ethnic culture and uplift a multiplicity of stories from the communities in which I have lived. I have been fortunate to work for many NEA-supported theaters during my career, all of which were imbued with a sense of community commitment. At Mixed Blood Theater in Minnesota, um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I acted in Kui Wins Viet Gone, which upended stereotypes of Asian men. Um, uh, that, uh, that Asian men can't be sexy, that people who speak English with a foreign accent are ignorant. Um, in La Jolla Playhouse, we created a veterans writers workshop that uh, help um, people tell their stories, uh, um, th these, uh, the servicemen to tell their stories. The act of writing helped them to process their time in service, assisted in acclimation to civil, civilian life, and built a sense of mission and camaraderie within the group. And then in, in Perseverance Theater in, um, in Alaska, I was given the opportunity to perform in the long season by Che Yu, um, which uh, was about Filipino cannery workers fighting for equal pay. These types of roles, roles that sh show under under underrepresented people with complex inner lives and intelligence are rare in traditional theater. Thank you. I will um, please um, I thank the Sub Committee for this opportunity to speak and um, uh, respectfully urge you to support the agency uh, at the level of 167.5 million in fiscal year 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, Alexander Tittle, board member from the Minnesota Humanities Center. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chairwoman McCollum and members of the subcommittee. I thank you for the opportunity to, to, to present testimony on behalf of the State Humanities Council, the state affiliates of the National Endowment of the Humanities. My name is Alex Tittle and I am a member of the board of the Humanities, Minnesota Humanities Center, the Minnesota affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'm here to request $167.5 million for the National Endowment for the Humanities and $53 million for the federal and state partnership for fiscal year 2019. I'm the Disparity Reduction Director for Hennepin County, which is a county within uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul area. Prior to that, I was the Vice President of Business Connect and Corporate Affairs for the Minnesota Super Bowl 2018. Before that, I was the equity director for the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authority, an agency of responsible for the design and construction of the U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. And before that, civil rights director for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I cite my business and government affiliations simply to, because I, I believe that it helps illustrate the wide variety of individuals who believe so strongly in the role that the humanities play in the communities across our nation that they are willing to volunteer their time to helping these most important programs to thrive. It should come as no surprise that our country is in dire straits as it relates to disparities. Uh, by 2025, kids of color are in, in, the, in the, excuse me, by 2025, kids of color uh, will be the majority of, U, of U.S. high school students. The 
the state that we're in as a country needs to change. And I believe and I'm confident as I see and I sit into the board meetings at the Humanities Center that we are making a tremendous uh, ground and in, in, in moving the, the dial around that. As a proud member of the Humanities Center, uh, a board of directors since 2015, I have seen the impact of the work of State Humanities Council upon individuals, neighborhoods, states, and regions. The state councils are the local face of the humanities, developing and develop delivering the programs that, that address the issues of greatest concern to their communities, helping them explore their history and culture, and sharing the stories of many of our diverse populations. The councils are also a major source of, gra of grants to local educational, cultural, and historical organizations for, pu for public programming in places where a small grant of se several hundred to a few thousand dollars can make an enormous difference in the life of our communities. I'm also, as many of my predecessors that came to speak this morning, a, uh, I am a veteran of United States Armed Services. In that capacity, have a have been a direct beneficiary of the Minnesota Humanities Center programs. I participated in the center's first Veteran Voices program, which draws on the humanities to call attention to veterans' contributions and stories, allowing veterans to express themselves through storytelling, art, theater, discussion groups, and other activities. The program helps us veterans give voice to our experiences and to promote a better understanding below, excuse me, between the military and civilians. Basically, just as the, the, gunnery, the master gunnery sarg sergeant spoke earlier, that uh, it's an effort to ensure that our veterans, our brothers and sisters in arms, um, have a understanding of the suicide rates that are happening. This is, a se this is serious business, and really uh, regular medical treatment doesn't always help. Um, the, the work that we're doing at the Humanity Center is making all the difference. It has made a difference in my life, and I see it making a difference in the lives of my brothers and sisters who are recently returned from theater um, on a regular basis. It is the continuing expand program such as this, our communities and nation, that I am asking for the funding levels of $165 million um, from the NEH and $53 million for the councils. The, net, the state humanities councils are stretched thin in our, their ability to meet local and needs and requests and to collaborate with local businesses, cultural organizations, and institutions such as schools, libraries, museums, after-school programs, and many other groups seeking to better the lives of, li of those in, their, in these communities. I've sat in Humanity Center board meetings in which we have deliberated for hours about how to allocate scarce resources among the many le legitimate demands that are presented to us from a wide range of deserving populations. Councils are also ex experts, however, at using our federal funds to attack other funding. On average, over the past few years, councils have been able to leverage $4 at the local level for, very, for every federal dollar granted. The st serving Serving is important. Serving is important to all of us. I'd like to just reiterate the fact that as a veteran of 10 years in the United States Armed Services, that this program, the Veteran Voices program, started a number of years ago, makes all the difference to the veterans in the state of Minnesota because we're not a large veteran community. And, and, and we need that program to continue. And it also concerns, or it also relates to the humanities and the fact of education. Education for our young people, more so education for our teachers. We collaborated with uh, the University of Minnesota recently with um, a professor by the name of Alex Pate. Alex Pate is a, is, was the author of the book Amistad. And basically what he recognized that there's a diverse population shortage in our country from teacher's perspective. Okay? We can't change that. But one thing that we know is uh, a concept that he's developed called innocent classrooms. One thing that he's, he's mentioned to us is that kids, kids within the first five minutes of meeting a teacher know whether or not they care about them or not. And that's something that we're giving to these teachers from the Humanities Center that's making all the difference. So again, I, I plead, I ask that we, we consider the, uh, the financial um, 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 grant for the Humanities. Thank you. I stand ready for questions if you might have them.
Thank you all for um, your testimony. Really wonderful to hear from all of you, and thank you for your service and for uh, reminding us again how important the programs are for returning veterans, both in the arts and humanities. And I'll just reiterate, from my perspective, um, the state arts councils and the people who do those jobs um, are just critically important, and any increase we can have in funding makes a huge difference, I know, at the state level. So I appreciate all of you sharing your you. great work with all of us, and I will say that it's very exciting to have a chair from Minnesota since I went to, I grew up in Minnesota through high school, so yeah, okay. sure, you okay. betcha, <laughs> of that state. Um, although I represent Maine, and I'm very proud of you. <laughs> so, Mr. Great. Joyce. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and thank you for your service. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you very much for your testimony and your service. Thank you. Stromaday. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, Mr. Bro. I want to thank you for your testimony, and, and I know that the, the chairwoman, the vice chair, and the ranking member have never used the phrase patron of the arts and my name in the same sentence. However, <laughs> <laughs> starting with my state legislative career, when, when you talk about the, uh, the, the program, the state's arts, agencies, grants, and stuff like that, it's one of the few times I can recall in over however many years of legislative service that when we funded that from the state level and from the national level, your organization was phenomenally unique in having people, especially at the state level, write a handwritten note saying those two magic words, thank you. A and I can't, uh, patron of the arts, yeah, but everybody's got their own style. To get those notes from those people who got like a $5,300 grant, stuff like that, was phenomenally powerful when you talk about appropriating funds at a state or now the federal level to have somebody come back and go, hey, thanks for that program that you supported is phenomenally powerful. So I just wanted to publicly say whoever's idea that was, and it isn't a new one, um, it's a phenomenal legacy to have somebody come back and just say thank you. So I, I just wanted to make sure that it's like th those notes were not lost on, on this guy who didn't graduate from high school in Minnesota, but did, I believe, have to get a high school diploma. I'll check and make sure in Nevada. And, and, and the last thing I want to say is what branch did you serve in, Mr. Till? U.S. Army. Atta boy. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. you're in. <laughs> Double the funding. And thank you. Uh, um, I will uh, recognize the chair and yield back, and thank you for letting me introduce the panel. Certainly. Thank you. Um, so. I think what you you attested to kind of builds on what we heard earlier, but it's about how the arts bring us together, allow us to explore one another, sometimes in uncomfortable situations, to learn, to grow, to heal. Um, so I'm gonna kind of just throw something out there and then maybe ask you to quickly respond um, on it. Um, and I'm gonna use some of the, the information that you shared, 40% uh, formula and how important that is to the state level because then that uh, that gives an opportunity for you to focus on year 25 25 where the majority of our our students are going to be students of, of color and then you brought in I'm, I'm a social studies teacher by trade right um, in your written testimony you know uh, 2050, uh, the Declaration of Independence, we're gonna have another big celebration. Um, um, why treaties matter, how important that was in, in, in healing back home, and um, Park Square Court Theater, 1972. Yeah. Yeah, year I graduated from high school is when, <laughs> Park, when Park uh, uh, started um, moving forward. Could you just talk about how important it is to have the flexibility that you get from the arts organizations to develop programs close to your communities? And I'm gonna ask you all collectively to do that in about a minute apiece. Because I think it's important to hear your voices. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm happy to begin. Uh, and so my response will be broader because of the reach of uh, state arts agencies. Uh, the 40, you mentioned the 40% uh, share of the uh, NEA's uh, grant dollars. The 40-60 split is so incredibly important uh, to the arts nationally as well as at the local level. What the 40% side does, the state side does, that the 60% doesn't, is it responds very specifically to state articulated needs citizens, 
uh, uh, participate in strategic planning for state arts agencies. And so their needs are articulated by them and met by the 40% side. On the 60% side, uh, national competition certainly helps organizations leverage new private dollars. But the 60% side also has a value in that it demonstrates National Endowment for the Arts leadership opportunities. The very creation of creative forces is a leadership role uh, of the NEAs and its ability to invest in that on the 60% side created then opportunity for uh, states and locals to engage and match after this demonstration project uh, was created and funded nationally. So distinct parts of the equation, both really important down at the local level. Thank you. Do you gentlemen want to add anything? <coughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I think, you know, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, flexibility. So how does this help us when around flexibility? Simply because when we start working with our communities, particularly as you, um, uh, Chairwoman, as you mentioned about why treaties matter and looking at our, com our Native American communities. When we start to unpackage the challenges inherent in those communities, they become vast. And we have to be nimble when we see those things. We can't just say, well, this money is just for this or this money is just for that. It's important that we actually address the challenges that we see in those folks who are on the ground those teachers, those those individuals who represent those communities, um, they have to be, uh, they have to be flexible, um, and I think that through the through the education effort that happens within the, the this programming, we're able to do that. We're able to take a far reach into rural Minnesota in our area, in, in rural Minnesota, and address teachers who don't have resources because those sovereign nations aren't equipped or aren't, aren't supported like other public school systems. And in some cases, some would say some public school systems aren't equipped enough. Yeah. So we have to do additional to make sure that entire state is, is, uh, is supported. Okay, thank you. Hi. You get the last word. You know, I'm, uh, I just want to say I'm here on, um, by request of the Theater Communi Communications Group. And I just want to say that in terms of the funding, the flexibility, um, it allows us to have conversations, for example, with Mayor Carter and to say, what is exactly are the conversations that you're wanting to have with the community? And we can like then go and move with the funding that we have to be able to, to have a direct dialogue with the people um, or their audiences and not have to you know, have a two-year, three-year window in which to, to raise funds. It allows us the opportunity to, to be immediate, which is, which is I think, um, one of the wonderful things about theater. It can, it can move quickly if we have the funding to do that. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you all for, for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Dress, I'll let you introduce the next panel. When you're ready, Mr. Joyce. Thank you for being here. And I, uh, I know Madam Chairwoman had brought it up before, but I just, it bears repeating, there's only four of us on this side. Three of us are, com are also uh, part of the Financial Services uh, Subcommittee, which is meeting. Uh, Chris is also on Intel, and uh, another one is a ranking member. So uh, don't worry, we're taking copious notes to make sure everybody on our side hears your testimony as well. And I'd like to recognize, starting with Dr. Cromer, uh, for five minutes, please. Yeah, thank you. And I had a chance to speak through Representative Stewart, so I'm not offended in any way. <laughs> Uh, uh, Chair and Ranking Member, thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Cromer. I'm testifying on behalf of the American Thoracic Society uh, to share our recommendations on funding and policy issues facing clean air issues and, and the Environmental Protection Agency. I want to thank the committee uh, for level funding from the majority of EPA clean air programs in fiscal year 2019. Uh, we haven't seen a budget for fiscal year 2020 yet, so it's hard to comment on what's, what the priorities will be for next year. Uh, but I think we can safely look to earlier budgets to see that there's not a high value being placed on the work being done in the EPA. Uh, that's 
disappointing uh, because EPA is really doing good work in our communities, uh, and I'm going to share some examples in my home state of Utah, if that's okay. I currently serve on the Utah Air Quality Board. It's a governor-appointed board made up of business, business and local government, health, and nonprofit community members. Uh, we're charged with developing plans to meet federal air quality regulations and to generally protect the air quality in the state. Uh, as a board member, I'm personally aware of the essential role that EPA targeted airshed grants played in helping us improve air quality. Uh, in 2016, Utah received an EPA grant to purchase 33 new school buses and initiate a vehicle repair and replacement program to assist in repairing vehicles that fail to meet emission standards. Uh, these programs have been successful. Uh, they remove approximately 131 tons of NOx emissions, 11 tons of PM emissions, 99 tons of VOC emissions over the lifetime of the vehicles. Uh, in 2018, Utah received an additional $3 million in EPA funding to address diesel truck emissions. Uh, the program is still being implemented, but it's expected that it will reduce nearly 100 tons of pollution each year. And then the most important aspect is based on the success of these EPA funded efforts, the Utah legislature is still is currently considering allocating $100 million of state funds to continue and expand these programs. So a small investment from EPA is leading to a larger investment from the state. Uh, these targeted airshed grants are economically efficient. They help communities with severe air pollution problems improve air quality. Uh, communities like Fairbanks, Alaska, LA, California, and Salt Lake City, just to name a few. Uh, unfortunately, in the past two years, the administration has proposed steep cuts to these programs, and we encourage you guys to see the value in these programs. Uh, the administration has also proposed steep cuts in the EPA clean air science programs, enforcement programs, climate programs, and indoor air programs, and I urge the, this committee to see the wisdom and continue to support these valuable programs. Uh, while the proposed budget cuts are concerning, there's other steps the administration has taken that threaten our nation's air quality. Uh, I understand that for this next year, the priority will be deregulation at the EPA, and while that might uh, save some firms some money, and might, I, I can't speak to the political value, uh, from an economic perspective, it, it may be a little short-sighted, and hopefully I can explain that just a little bit. Uh, a non-exhaustive list of proposed rollbacks include the Clean Power Plan, Mercury Air Toxics Rule, Wood Stove New Source Performance Standards, Glider Kits Rules, and Vehicle Tailpipe and Fuel Efficiency Standards. And the reason it's, it's short-sighted from an economic perspective is there's jurisdictional issues in the Clean Air Act. So some of the major sources of pollution can only be addressed at the federal level. And if we roll back these regulations, what states have to do is they have to look for places to cut the emissions in other places. Uh, often these, these other cuts we have to make are more expensive and they have a, a larger inverse impact on local businesses and citizens. So I urge you to think about the broader economic impacts of some of these rollbacks. Uh, finally, I want to bring to the committee's attention a critical issue that is an urgent need uh, that we need to address, uh, namely the health impacts from wildfires. Uh, wildfires have long been a source of air pollution, but their frequency, intensity, and proportional contribution to particulate air pollution uh, has increased in the last 10 years. Uh, wildland fires now contribute up to a third of the annual average PMS in the U.S., and 40 percent of new home construction since 1990 has been in the wildland urban interface. Uh, currently, wildfires and controlled burns are in the purview of the Department of Interior, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, but there's been limited coordination and interaction with sister agencies. Um, there's a lot we still don't know about the health impacts from wildfires, and a lot we don't know about practical issues. Uh, things like, are masks and indoor cleaners effective, reduce exposures? Uh, what symptoms should people expect or be aware of to, in order to request help? And how do we effectively communicate to the public about wildfire public health issues? Uh, responding to the challenges of wildfires requires a multidisciplinary cross-agency effort, and this is best moderated by the EPA given its prime air health directive. Uh, to this end, the ATS is asking and recommends uh, new funding, uh, new $15 million of EPA funding over the next five years to address wildfire issues, and we've broken it down in the written testimony on how that can uh, best be accomplished. Uh, in conclusion, I strongly urge the subcommittee to maintain funding for the wide range of effective EPA clean air science enforcement and grants programs. I further recommend the committee provide an additional $15 million for EPA to better respond to the growing public health crisis posed by wildfires. And communities across the country, including my home state of Utah, Representative Stewart's home state of Utah, uh, will benefit from this investment in clean air programs. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And next we'll hear from uh, Dr. Rizzo. Good morning. Five minutes. Good morning, uh, Chair G McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. 
My name is Dr. Albert Rizzo, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the American Lung Association, whose mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. For this reason, I'm here to urge the subcommittee to increase its investment in the programs of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that protect the public health from air pollution. It's also critical that this and all appropriation bills are free of any harmful policy riders that would weaken EPA's ability to protect the public health. We truly appreciate the name of the session, Environment with a Public Health Focus. EPA's programs, many of which are protected by the Clean Air Act, are critical for protecting the Americans, especially those with lung disease, from harmful air pollution. Specific funding requests are in my written comments, but today I want to convey the sense of urgency of increasing funding overall for EPA's clean air and climate change work. In addition to my work with the American Lung Association, I'm a practicing pulmonary physician in Delaware, and air pollution is lethal, and cleaning it up protects my patients, your constituents, from an array of health harms, such as asthma attacks with missed school days and missed work days, heart attacks, and premature deaths. Air pollution affects everyone, but there are those at higher risk patients with lung disease, children, seniors, pregnant women, those in low-income communities, and many communities of color. My location in Delaware illustrates a critical role that the federal government plays in protecting Americans from air pollution. Delaware has worked tirelessly to reduce its emissions. We have stringent controls on power plants and other industrial facilities. We have adopted low emission standards for our vehicles. But we're at the mercy of states upwind of us. Over 90 percent of Delaware's unhealthy ozone levels originate from out-of-state power plants with weaker pollution controls that emit dangerous pollution that ends up in our lungs. That's why it's so critical that this nation continues to invest in the EPA. All of our states need strong support from the federal government to protect their residents. EPA needs more resources to implement and enforce the life-saving protections in place under the Clean Air Act and to work with states, local governments, and tribes to monitor and reduce emissions across the country. Thanks to the Clean Air Act, the nation has made enormous strides in reducing harmful outdoor air pollution. It is estimated that in 2020, the Clean Air Act amendment will prevent over 230,000 premature deaths. However, that progress is at risk for two key reasons. First, despite the clear mandate of the EPA to protect human health from air pollution, proposals by the Trump administration would weaken, delay, or rescind clean air protections. These include repealing the Clean Power Plan, and replacing it with a rule that could be worse for health than doing nothing at all. It would also call for gutting carbon standards for new plants, undermining limits on mercury and other air toxics, rolling back limits on greenhouse gases from vehicles, allowing more super polluting trucks on the road, censoring the health science, and cherry picking the data that supports these rollbacks. Despite these proposed rollbacks, the staff at EPA are still doing the life saving work of helping protect human health from air pollution across the country, and we must support this critical work. The progress toward healthy air for all to breathe is also at risk because of climate change. Climate change is a public health emergency. Wildfire smoke, extreme heat, increased levels of ozone pollution, disruption of medical care during extreme storms, and health hazards of the disaster cleanup are all part of the substances that put lungs at risk. I'd like to close with a sh story that a woman from Pennsylvania, Claudia, shared with our staff recently. Her teenage son, Jesse, was diagnosed with asthma as a toddler. Claudia makes every effort to control for possible asthma triggers inside her home, but she can't control the quality of the air when Jesse steps outside. She checks her air quality alerts on her phones every day and knows that on hazy, hot, humid days, the ozone smog level is going to be high, and Jesse has to limit his time outside. Claudia's message to you, our legislators, in Washington is to know that families can do everything they can at home to keep their kids healthy, but we need your leadership. Madam Chair, the American Lung Association often says when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And thanks to your investments in EPA, our nation has made enormous progress in reducing harmful air pollution. We call on you now to further the fund the EPA and its life-saving work, implementing and enforcing protections under the Clean Air Act, and ensure that your bill does not contain any harmful policy riders that would undermine this work. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Keogh, you're recognized for five minutes now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Ranking Member, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Miles Keogh. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies, which convenes 154 of the 170 uh, state and local clean air agencies across the country. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, uh, making three asks of y'all. 
uh, and on behalf of all the clean air agencies in every state of the country, so uh, benefiting your constituents no matter where you are. The three asks, as I'll explain more uh, fully in, in brief remarks, uh, one, uh, to increase the federal grants to state and local air agencies to make up for 15 years of essentially level funding uh, for those agencies um, uh, of an additional $82 million over uh, what's currently funded for a total of $310 million. Second, to provide flexibility for agencies uh, for how they use the funds to address the highest uh, priorities rather than uh, focus them on uh, areas that are lower priorities. And third, retain grants for monitoring fine particulate matter under the authority of Section 103. So uh, thank you for listening to this testimony this morning. I think that, there, that there, this is uh, an important step to, to really understand where we are. A, a good national air quality program is a hell of an investment in America. The Clean Air Act's uh, 1990 investments, depending on how you read the cost-benefit analyses, have returned between 30 to 1 or 90 to 1 uh, in terms of uh, th the payoff. I think anyone who I said, if I give you a, a dollar now and you have to give me $90 later would recognize that's a great return on investment. And um, this is really important. Uh, it's really done great strides uh, to improve public health, but by some estimates, air pollution still shortens more lives of Americans than gun violence and car crashes put together. So we still have a lot of work to do in this arena. Um, the state and local agencies work in partnership with EPA, and the responsibilities facing these agencies have continued to grow while the federal funding has stayed fairly stagnant for some time. The Federal grants to state and local air quality agencies under sections 103 and 105 of the Clean Air Act were $228 million in fiscal year 2019. That's the same number as in fiscal year 2004. Everything costs a lot more than it did in 2004. We did an analysis about 12 years ago about the need for increases, and trust me, it's a lot more than $310 million even then. But this would be a critical investment just to keep pace with the change in the purchasing power of the dollars that would be afforded to these agencies. Uh, secondly, uh, we need the, the funding to be, uh, for the states to have the, and locals to have the flexibility to use uh, funds for the highest priority programs. And third, um, for monitoring equipment, especially for fine particulate, to remain in uh, Section 103 authority rather than moving to Section 105 authority, because 105 requires matching funds by the states, and it's a real disincentive for some states that are really, you know, sitting on 15 years without a change in their funding uh, as to whether they'll improve that equipment or whether they'll just hold it together with duct tape. Um, the uh, the Clean Air Act originally envisioned federal government support for about 60 percent of the funding, and today it's about 25 percent of what uh, state and local agencies use, in some cases much less. But the work that we're taking on is a lot different than it was 15 years ago. Wildfires, new kinds of air toxics, PFAS, certainly climate change. Um, we're, the public uh, uh, assimilates information via social media that didn't exist 15 years ago. The changes are really tall. And no matter how you feel about the regulatory uh, reforms being undertaken by EPA, it's impossible to argue that they do not shift the balance of responsibility to state and local agencies. So we really need your help. So how would we use these uh, funds? We'd uh, bring more areas into attainment with clean air standards. We'd reduce the concentration of fine particulates. We'd improve small business compliance assistance. We'd, monitor, we'd modernize our modeling tools, increase the frequency of our inspections, improve our monitoring, uh, develop better risk assessment capabilities, and improve our communications with the public so that they can protect their health. All these activities are critical to our mission. So in conclusion, NACA urges Congress to increase federal grants to all state and local air agencies by $82 million over uh, FY19 levels for a total of $310 million to give us the flexibility to solve the problems that need the most solving and to retain grants for our monitors under the Section uh, 103 authority. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. And now we'll hear from Ms. Shepard. You have five minutes to address us. Good morning. Executive Director of We Act for Environmental Justice. We are a 31-year-old 
membership organization based in Harlem and New York City. We work to build healthy communities by organizing residents of color and low income to engage in the creation of environmental health and protection policies at a city, state, and local level. Environmental justice is the perspective that all communities deserve equity and environmental protection, enforcement of existing laws, siting of noxious facilities, and consultation in the development of government policies and regulations. Environmental justice places human health at the center of environmental struggles, understanding that communities of color and low income are home to more susceptible populations, that children in their early stages of development are more vulnerable, and that multiple environmental exposures must be addressed by studying their cumulative impact and synergistic effects on health. Why is that necessary? Because permitting of polluting facilities is established facility by facility. When there is a multitude of these sources in one community, there is a cumulative impact on the residents. And this cumulative impact is not measured or regulated despite the fact that the National Environmental Protection Act, or NEPA, calls for an assessment whether or not a federal action has the potential to individually or cumulatively have a significant effect on the human environment. However, that assessment doesn't happen because the EPA has never developed a final guidance on cumulative impacts. Yet this is at the heart of environmental justice concerns due to the disparate impact of pollution in those communities. This subcommittee should consider holding hearings to catalyze federal policy on cumulative impacts and synergistic effects on these communities. Now, we know that increased exposure to air toxics can begin in the womb due to the mother's exposure, cross the placenta, and result in results such as low birth weight, developmental delays, asthma attacks, and genetic alteration. The Columbia Center for Children's Environmental Health, where I've served as a co-principal investigator for the past 20 years, has developed these uh, cutting edge studies and research, and we need to continue the investment in these 11 centers around the country that is funded by the EPA and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Now, we know that place matters. Your zip code is determinant of your health status. The crisis in Flint reminds us that we must invest in lead-free homes, but without financing for low-income homeowners, public housing authorities, and moderate-income housing, this toxic legacy of lead and gasoline and paint still persists. So we must support a Healthy Homes initiative that eradicates mold and lead from homes in the most vulnerable, like those in Cancer Alley, a 100-mile stretch of land between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, where former agricultural plantations have been replaced by oil refineries and 175 heavy industrial plants. In Houston, Oakland, and Newark, the transportation impacts from ports and goods movement terrorizes areas of people of color with truck movement and emissions that exacerbate asthma and heart disease. In New York City, public housing is home to over 600,000 people of color and low income, residents living in shameful conditions of mold, pests, and housing deterioration that may be causal and contributes to the appalling incidence of chronic disease. Farm workers and their children and pregnant women are working in fields sprayed with chlorpyrifos, which has been banned by the EPA for residential use, but is still allowed to be used in agriculture. And it was about to be banned uh, by the EPA when the new administration moved in and rolled that back. The Gwich'in tribe of Arctic Village in Alaska faces drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. It will risk the, the future of their village and the caribou herd, which they depend on for food, clothing, community, and culture. Their homes are currently threatened by global warming, uh, permafrost, seen in permafrost and river changes, and drilling proposals. These sacrifice zones are a moral outrage. We must pledge to end this dichotomy of two Americas, of throwaway communities, of the acceptance that we will always have winners and losers. So we must lift up the struggle for climate justice uh, and reject the cap-and-trade mechanism that results in environmental justice communities not getting reductions in toxic air emissions. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the challenges that our underserved communities are facing. Back in 1994, President Clinton issued an executive order, 12898, on environmental justice, which needs to be fully implemented and codified into law. And to achieve these goals, we will need leadership, commitment, and strong oversight. Thank you.
Well, thank you for your testimony. And uh, last but not least, uh, Ms. Roberts, you're recognized now for five minutes. Thank you. It's wonderful following my dear friend, uh, Dr. Peggy Shepard. I agree with everything she said, so I can add on to my statement. Good morning. My name is Michelle Roberts, and thank you for inviting me to testify before you. Uh, I come before you as the national co-coordinator of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for chemical policy reform. We are a collective of fence line groups who live under some of our nation's most egregious operations. Um, they live fence line and their health, uh, as you heard Peggy Shepard and others speak, uh, their health is compromised as a result of that in many forms of disparities, um, beginning with the state where I am originally from, that being Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, we are also happy to be able to uh, also in our network uh, be part of what's called a larger collective, the Coming Clean Collective, where we have uh, a collective of science, uh, advocates, policy makers, and others who support the capacity building that our communities need. And, and equally, we're pleased to say that one of our ally members is here with us uh, today, and that's the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy, which is based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, we are happy also to work with our friends out of New Jersey, Dr. Nikki Sheets and the New Jersey Environmental Justice Alliance. Uh, you know, the communities that we represent are those who are impacted first and worst during industrial and natural disasters. Uh, as I said, we agree with everything that uh, Peggy Shepard just uh, read, uh, but what we wish to speak to today is the fact that many of our communities are impacted by disasters. They are the canary in the minefield, as you say. Um, I come before you to encourage you to ensure, ensure all forms of safety protections under your, under your jurisdictions are fully funded. This is necessary to protect communities such as those represented in EJHA. Our communities have organized and pushed hard for many years to achieve and gain the modest gains that they have today, such as the Executive Order 13650, uh, securing chemical facility safety and management systems. We need that actual act, uh, EO codified. In addition to that, um, our communities like uh, Charleston, West Virginia, folks over in Wisconsin who were impacted by the Husky refinery fire um, that could have impacted Minnesota in many ways. Um, the folks in Mossville, Louisiana, who have lost their home to homes and their land and their lives and their culture to big energy and refineries and their health as well have been compromised. People in Charleston, West Virginia, who are still purchasing uh, $5 bottles of water, as Ms. Sue Ferguson said in Institute West Virginia, just to bathe herself on the heels of the Elk River disaster, where I am from Wilmington, Delaware, where a Crota, the Crota facility shut down the Delaware Memorial Bridge for six and one half hours on both sides of the bridge, um, Delaware and New Jersey, thereby leaving communities of to aimlessly wander through the nights, wondering what was going on as the highways rolled through their communities on the Sunday following Thanksgiving, one of the most highly traffic traffic time of the of the year leaving also volunteer fire departments and others to actually have to deal with these fires. And so therefore, they need funding and training. This particular facility in Delaware actually emitted ethylene oxide, and to today, uh, the community members are, to this moment, wondering what, how their health was compromised and what it is they must do for remediation and remedy, not only at, in addition to understanding that they are living on what is called the industrial corridor, thereby having other, as Peggy Shepard alluded to, cumulative impacts in their communities. Uh, 
All the reasons we need the Environmental Protection Agency and the Chemical Safety Board to be fully uh, funded. In addition to that, our communities are proliferated with these cheap dollar stores, 99 cents and dollar stores, uh, bringing uh, toxic uh, products and, and stocking shelves of toxic products to which we need the consumer safety protection uh, standards actually implemented. Our communities to save time, we have actually set, sent and shared many of our documents with you as a whole host of them because of the fact that, again, our communities must prove the fact that they are first and worst, must prove the fact that they have high disparities, must prove the fact that they need cumulative impacts analysis before any and all permits are offered. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to testify and ask that you fully fund the EPA's enforcement especially, and that of the Chemical Safety Board. Thank you very much, and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and uh, I'd like to recognize first uh, my distinguished colleague, Mrs. Uh, Coleman Watson. Watson Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome to you. It's good to see you, Peggy Shepard. It is good to hear Nikki Sheets name mentioned. I often get uh, visits from him from around the corner just to bring me up to date. Um, it's good to hear from you, Dr. Rizzo. I am a lung patient. I just left my pulmonologist, which is why I was late. Um, and, I, and I believe that um, a couple of things. A is that we need to fully fund those programs to keep our air and, and our water, for that matter, uh, safe, usable, breathable, drinkable. And I also think that we need to be concerned that while we will fund EPA, we need EPA to do the work it is supposed to do. I'm concerned about something that you mentioned, Dr. Shepard, and that was, you said that there is a requirement for a, a cumulative assessment, but that it's never been done because EPA has never developed an instrument or, or has never held anyone accountable for that? They've never developed a guidance for states, and as a result, states and judges say, well, we don't know how to measure uh, or assess cumulative impact. So when an environmental impact statement is being done, uh, the cumulative impact part of that just mm -hmm. isn't addressed. So that's something that um, I'm glad that I know about now, and I will talk to my chairman about uh, such a thing. But our, our, our major concern is not that we won't fund EPA, but that EPA will get to do the work that it is intended to do. So I thank you very much for y all of you, for all of your um, testimony, and I thank you for yielding to me. I yield back. Thank you. Um, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Joyce. Um, I would like, I'm going to put a couple of things together, and I, and I reflect uh, my colleagues' statements about the accumulative exposure power, uh, you know, and the power that it has to be destructive in your body. It's something as a state representative, as a mom, uh, you know, just as a citizen, it's something that you really worry about, especially the fact that we don't have good science on how some of these toxic chemicals really affect um, children, both prenatal and in their development stages. So thank you for raising that, and uh, that's something that I know this committee would like to look into more um, in the coming um, months. Um, and thanks for all the extra homework. I'm a former teacher with the clicks, Ms. Raj, <laughs> Ms. Rogers. I didn't have time last night to click on everything because I was afraid of how many pages they were going to be, and I didn't want to be up too late. But I really do look forward um, to looking at um, the, the extra reports that you added on. Could I um, just um, talk about some of the things that you, you're seeing as uh, a lack of um, emphasis. You mentioned the, the accumulation um, ex exposures and that. But, um, you know, th things that you mentioned, wildland fires that we need to look into. What are some of the emerging issues that this committee should be looking at um, making sure that uh, we're we're thinking and asking when the EPA comes in where they are on things. So, and not to put you on the spot, you can contact us a little more um, later, but you may, if you, just one emerging issue or something that you think we're negligent on, just one thing and I'll go down the panel. 
Well, I think it was touched on. The emerging thing is we have great standards right now. They need to be improved, but they also cannot be rolled back. So making sure that the Clean Air Act is set to be enforced the way it's meant to. And as a lung association, we often urge it along to help make sure they're doing what they're doing because those changes are going to be more important as climate change makes all these things worse, wildfires and ozone. Okay. Seconded exactly what Dr. Rizzo said. Also adding, um, there are a number of emerging toxins. Uh, there are a number of, uh, in the air toxic space, some for which um, uh, new uh, RTRs and other procedures need to be done, some which, um, like PFAS, for example, uh, we need to understand better how it moves, how the exposures work, um, and, and a much more serious uh, investment in that space would be uh, would be very a good investment. I'm going to double down on wildfires. Uh, if you look at the largest unmet need and the biggest current issue, uh, we can actually make a big difference here with a, uh, an investment in this area. Uh, it's something that we need all across the whole U.S. So wildfires is an area we should encourage the EPA to embrace. Um, to date, they don't really do anything on wildfires. They just look at uh, exceptional events and, and uh, can we excuse states from their regulatory responsibility if there's a wildfire? But in terms of thinking about health impacts, it's something we need to invest in. Yeah, TASCA reform, uh, which should be happening, be implemented at the EPA, is not really being implemented. And uh, the fact that most of our chemicals are not really studied and assessed is, is a continuing problem. We have phthalates and PFAS, uh, which is ubiquitous. Uh, phthalates in, in our food, in, in all of our consumer products, and consumer products and cosmetics are not regulated. Um, I would also just uh, double back on something you said. We do have very good research on the impact of uh, environmental exposures on children, and we just need to take action. If we look at the results from the 11 or 17 children's environmental health centers that have been funded for the past 20 years, there is groundbreaking evidence. We just are not taking action on it. In addition to that, I agree with all of those points that were raised. We really need to hone in on this cumulative impacts because until we look at that and address that of the, the multiplicity of chemicals that have proliferated on this market, um, we are really setting ourselves up for enormous failures. Um, we cannot allow for certain populations to be at risk. That is morally unconscionable. We need to have the moral and political consciousness to be able to really dig deep and really pass a robust TOSCA reform package that looks addresses legacy communities and factors in that of cumulative impacts. No one, no one, absolutely no one should be at risk, especially in the disproportionate numbers that we have today. Thank you very much. So one theme I heard come through was climate change and looking at the way climate change is uh, going to put at risk not only our air quality but our water qual quality as well in these extreme weather patterns that, that we're seeing um, and the way that we're now um, talking, whether it's fires or wh whatever, you know, for air quality, for people, um, you know, to be, to be aware, to be safe, but we don't know what we're telling them to be aware of wh at what level. So I want to thank um, all of you um, for your testimony. And with that, I, Ms. I'll yield back to you, Mr. Joyce, if Mr. Simpson has a question. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to recognize the former chairman of this committee and my distinguished colleague, uh, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Uh, um, you asked for $82 million more dollars in an account. I understand that. You all asked for full funding. I don't understand what that is. I don't know what number we're looking at. I don't know what full funding refers to. If there's a, is there a? We can get back to you with numbers. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate that because I, you know. Sure. Second thing, you want to get EPA involved in wildfires? Yeah, particularly. I have a tough time getting the Forest Service involved in fire, <laughs> wildfires. <laughs> yeah, anytime you have an issue where there's split responsibility, so you have OSHA who studies the face masks and whether they work or not, and then Department of Interior deals with the management issues, but no one's addressing the health impacts and the risk communication 
And because EPA has an expertise in the air health field, they're a natural place to lead this, this multi-agency effort to address wildfires. It's a big issue that's not being addressed. And, and in our view, the EPA is the best place to house that effort. Well, it's a huge issue in the West. In the West and in the, in the Southeast? Um, I, can't, well. I can't breathe in August in Idaho about half the time. Yeah, and, and, and there's a precedent for this. In, in the 90s, there's a big investment to study particle air pollution, and they set up some centers to study it. And that's when we really learned about its health impacts. Uh, we think that model would work for wildfires as well, and, and we have some details on how that could happen. But if, A, we know all the smoke in the air from wildfires is bad, not good to breathe it. The answer is don't have wildfires. Uh, other than that, I mean, you know, the EPA could spend a lot of money saying how bad it is, but I don't know what that does for us other than we know we need to reduce the amount of wildfires in the country. So I if I could just respond to that just for a moment. One thing we can do. <laughs> absolutely. No, no, no. One thing that we can do, uh, a, a lot of what the state and local agencies that have been uh, on the front lines of trying to communicate about wildfires have been doing is trying to do things like place mobile monitors so we know where the air is good and where it's bad. But we don't have that many of those, these EBAM uh, units that can be moved around. Um, improve our ability to communicate with the public about when um, uh, air quality is is uh, impacted by these things, uh, targeting communications to people who can then take action to protect themselves, uh, figuring out what works and, and uh, what kind of protective measures work as well. Um, a, a lot of the state and local agencies, especially in, in states like uh, Idaho, uh, Utah, California, and the like out in the West in particular, have really been doing great strides to trying to put together uh, good strategies with the equipment and with the knowledge base that they've got. Um, not to plug my ask again, but uh, catching them up for 15 years worth of level funding uh, would really improve their ability to be partners with EPA in in being effectively responsive in those conditions. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Chair, be more of a comment. So 15 years level funding, we've seen more more fires if we're just going to focus on air quality and fires and less resources being available for local communities, for cities, for states, for our national government to understand its overall effect on, on health care, I think, in and of itself, you, you just figure inflation, um, let alone, um, you know, we're seeing more and more episodes of this happening, really speaks to, you know, look, looking at the numbers. J just for the record, I've asked for a larger um, um, amount of money for this committee because of all the unmet needs that I know that you dealt with as chair and that, that, that Ken did and, and the rest of us. Uh, we just haven't had a very uh, substantial allocation, I think, to do a lot of the work that we'd like to do on both sides of the aisle for, for many of these. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm not disagreeing with what you all are saying. I'm just trying to vision what exactly it would be. I mean, every night I go home, especially in August and stuff, you know, you turn on the TV and the weather station will tell you what the air quality is that day. Uh, we have high schools canceling football games and <coughs> colleges canceling football games and stuff because of air quality and so forth. Uh, the answer to that is put out wildfires before they become these huge configurations and that is the Forest Service's responsibility. I don't want, I, I've seen too many times when you get several agencies involved in something, nothing gets done because they're all, you know, think they're the boss. I would hate to see that become the case in something like this, but I don't disagree with what you're talking about in monitoring and so forth, so thank you. Thank you. So thanks very much, the next panel. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have a question? You didn't go, I, look, he had, you have, you have no, a question. I was just going to tell Mr. Keel that this is his We're moment. doing on the record. This is your moment to, to shamelessly plug your activity, so that, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're doing so while you're here. There's no need to be embarrassed by it. And when you Thank went you to Mike, I figured you weren't going to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, our next panel up, um, Casey White, Director for Geoscience and Policy, Dr. Dan Delavan, uh, Delavan uh, President of the National Institutes for Water Resources. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I jumped one. My goodness, and forgive me for doing that. 
So, Mr. Chad Lord, who used to work in my office, <laughs> Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition, and Howard uh, Lerner, Executive Director for Environmental Law and Policy Center. Chad, did I give you a slight uh, heart attack? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> we'll still be glad to you. <laughs> you're a two-person panel, um, so you're, you're up in the next one. You just stay there. Just you just stay here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Lerner. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Howard Lerner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Law and Policy Center. Uh, thank you, Chair McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce, uh, for inviting us to testify this morning. We've worked for many years together to protect the Great Lakes. We are engaged with many colleagues and public officials in both creating, establishing, and building the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We recognize, we commend this subcommittee for the strong bipartisan support over the years for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and to make it work well. And I'll be making three points this morning. First, this is a vitally important and successful program. It's a model federal program providing great benefits. It's working well on the ground and on the waters. Second, the Appropriations Committee should provide at least continued support of $300 million annually for the program as it's been doing over the past years. Third, the committee should work to increase funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative to $475 million annually. That's the funding level the program began with and because of the problems and challenges, it's time to come back to the original funding for the program. As you understand, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative and the Great Lakes themselves face challenges, harmful algae booms in western Lake Erie, Lake Superior, and Lake Michigan throughout the Great Lakes, and the impacts of climate change that exacerbate the problems in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are a global gem they contain 21 percent of the world's fresh water supply, safe drinking water for 42 million people in the United States and Canada. They support a $7 billion fishing industry. They provide recreation <coughs> and they draw in millions of tourists for everything from sport fishing to other outdoor recreation. In short, if you live in the Midwest, the Great Lakes are where you live, they're where you work. It's where we play. But let me turn, if I could, to my first point. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is a common sense program. It's working well. It supported more than 4,000 projects to protect shorelands and coastal wetlands. It's cleaned up sediments in the St. Louis River area of concern in northern Minnesota, and it's helping to clean up nutrient runoff in western Lake Erie. It's funded and supported projects across the states to improve water quality so that we have safe water to drink, fisheries and aquatic habitats, and beaches across the lakes have been restored for swimming. In other words, fishable and swimmable in the Great Lakes. For more than 25 years, there were plans to restore the Great Lakes, but they were constrained by significant federal funding. The restoration initiative was a breakthrough. The program was initially planned for $500 million annually and a vision it would add to existing programs. It's been working well. Let me turn, if I could, to my second point. Um, the full House has consistently voted to appropriate $300 million of annual funding with strong bipartisan support from this subcommittee, from the full committee even when the President's budget has cut it back significantly. Hopefully this year and next, we can move beyond keeping the funding in place to the higher level of funding where the program began and what's fully justified. And that's my third point. This subcommittee should work to increase funding to $475 million annually. That was the original funding level. That money is useful, it's needed, the needs are great, and as we have harmful algae blooms, not just in Lake Erie, but in Lake Superior, in Lake Michigan, the other shallow water bays, 
we need to focus more resources on solving that problem. So last year, the Senate proposed in the Water Resources Development Act to increase funding up to $390 million in a couple of years. This year and next, the House should seize the leadership and the opportunity to move up to $475 million, which is where the program began. Focus on toxic algae blooms in the shallow water bays, the impact which scientists are telling us about climate change on the Great Lakes, making problems worse. We have a report coming out by a group of leading Midwest University scientists on the impacts of climate change and some of the solutions directed toward the Great Lakes. This is a successful program. It's been a model for federal and state and local cooperation. The time has come to move the funding back to the right level. It's where we live, work, and play. Thank you for inviting my testimony. And after Chad, I'd be pleased to address any questions you might have. Mr. Lord, welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone, for inviting us to testify today. My name is Chad Lord. I am the policy director for the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you a good story about what's happening because of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, where federal restoration investments are benefiting the environment and economy. Securing a strong plan to restore and protect the Great Lakes and the funding to implement it have been our coalition's guiding principle since our inception. For 15 years, we have harnessed the collective power of more than 150 groups representing millions of people whose common goal is to restore and protect one-fifth of the surface water on our planet and the source of drinking water for more than 30 million Americans. As I said, we have a good story to tell, and the story involves you. Because of your support, we are cleaning up toxic hotspots, restoring wetlands and habitat, controlling invasive species, and addressing polluted farm runoff, setting an example for the entire country. Problems that have plagued the area for decades are now being addressed thanks to the GLRI. Consider this. Because of the GLRI, Michigan's Two-Hearted River has seen increased recreational and fishing opportunities thanks to stabilized riverbanks. This work connected 35 miles of river and reduced sediment pollution by more than 600 tons per year. In Duluth, a conservation core project improved stream health in habitat while providing jobs for 14 unemployed or underemployed Duluth residents. The project worked with 175 landowners and to plant more than 18,000 trees and shrubs, which improved water quality as well as property values. North Point Marina Beach in the Chicago la Chicagoland area is safer now for residents to swim in. In 2007, the beach was closed for over three quarters of the swimming season due to bacteria buildup from gulls. But by planting native plants and grasses on the expansive beach, the ecosystem is no longer hospitable to these birds and bacterial pollution has decreased. Not only are we seeing these kinds of ecological results, the positive impacts from the GLRI on the region's and nation's economy, economic well-being is also clear. An economic report last fall demonstrated that the GLRI's ecological investments are resulting in significant economic ones as well. The studies show that for every $1 invested through 2016, it produces more than $3 in economic activity region-wide, and that will be through 2036. The GLRI is creating new real estate and commercial development, particularly in waterfront areas. Water-based outdoor recreation is resurging and tourism is increasing across the region. Housing options and home values are going up and an increasing number of young people are staying in or relocating to Great Lakes communities. The report documented that cleaning up the Great Lakes resulted in 27 new businesses opening since 2010 to serve growing numbers of waterfront visitors to Ashabula, Ohio. It helps set the stage for opening a multi-million dollar entertainment complex in Buffalo on an old industrial site. It created the conditions that allowed a Detroit kayak outfitter and tour company to see its business increase 500% since 2013. Even with all these results, the Great Lakes face serious threats. 19 U.S. areas of concern are still contaminated with toxic sentiment. Harmful runoff from farm fields continues to pollute our waters. Habitat loss and aquatic invasive species continue to damage our region's outdoor way of life, and Asian carp are still swimming towards Lake Michigan. Many of these threats disproportionately impact people that have historically borne the brunt of environmental injustice and our changing climate is exacerbating all our region's problems. This is why we need you to continue your support to protect and restore the Great Lakes. Maintaining funding is necessary to continue building, these building on these results, and we are ready for these investments with projects that are ready to break ground. 
Local non-federal partners are ready and willing to do their fair share, but without GLRI funding, these local investments could be left on the table. To keep restoration on track, we hope the subcommittee will provide at least $300 million for the GLRI again in fiscal year 2020. The GLRI, of course, works best when it, both existing federal agencies and programs as well as the GLRI have the funding they need to support each other. So we also urge you to maintain base budgets and programs at EPA, the Department of the Interior, and other agencies in order that the work we undertake together is carried out as efficiently and effectively as possible. Our work is producing results, but serious threats remain. Cutting restoration funding now will only make projects harder and more expensive the longer we wait. Thank you again for your support and the opportunity to share our views with you today. Thank you. Mr. Joyce. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Lerner, Mr. Lord. You both uh, stated that our case very well. The Great Lakes are an international treasure, an economic powerhouse, and the GLRI is a model program for federal, tribal, state, and local cooperation. Protecting the lakes is not a Republican or Democrat issue. Members from both sides of the political aisle understand the important role the lakes play in our lives and understand the importance of protecting them for current and future generations. Despite the progress we are witnessing in the region, there is still work to do to protect and restore the Great Lakes. Asian carp are on the verge of doing to the Great Lakes what they've done to Illinois, Ohio and Illinois River. Now is the time to cut the carp. Uh, now is not the time to cut the carp out of the budget at Interior. We must continue our efforts to prevent this invasive species from devastating the seven billion dollar Great Lakes fishing industry that we have. Now, Mr. Lord, could you briefly describe the important work being done by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Geological Survey to address this threat? Yes, both agencies have a number of things that they, they are undertaking, um, coordinated through the Asian Carp um, Regional Coordinating Committee, which was set up um, a number of years ago. Um, for example, the Fish and Wildlife Service works with local partners, such, such as in Illinois, but also even the upper Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys, to coordinate activities that address and help manage fish populations throughout those systems. Um, so working with fishermen and women um, to do overfishing and other types of activities, also monitoring activities and that sort of thing. USGS's role is, is a little different. Um, they're, they're more focused on the research side of things, and so they're developing technologies that will allow the managers at Fish and Wildlife Service and Illinois Department of Natural Resources and other state agencies to use new tools um, that will hopefully control these fish. So things like um, what I've been referred to as biobullets, which um, only Asian carp will eat and then hopefully die. Um, and other types of um, activities. Um, apparently, they're not very good to eat, so I don't know. I don't know. You haven't um, tried them. I have not tried them, no. Um, but other technologies like that, um, they've also developed um, different types of monitoring. They're developing new different types of um, monitoring technologies with DNA um, and other types of technology that will allow for better and more faster monitoring so we can monitor the populations. And so all of those resources are being developed to, for these things and that um, honestly can be exported to other parts of the country. Well, one day I was getting on the elevator and uh, there's three young ladies in there with their sushi for lunch and I said, uh, what do we have today? Some Asian carp and they all started laughing because they worked in Madam Chair's office. So they knew exactly <laughs> what, <laughs> what Asian carp was. Uh, and Mr. Lerner, you did bring up uh, the fact about the algal blooms. Yes. It's not limited to the Great Lakes. I found, and, and both of us in speaking uh, and being advocates on behalf of the GLRI, uh, uh, I was down at the Everglade Foundation and they're having a huge problem there and God forbid Lake Okeechobee ever breach uh, because it would really devastate the Everglades as well. As a matter of fact, there will be a meeting uh, latter part of March at the Wings Fred Conference Center in Racine, Wisconsin. For the first time really bringing together groups from the Everglades, the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, to begin looking at it on a much more cross-regional basis. Mm. You're exactly right. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Simpson? I'm not going to pretend to know more about <laughs> the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative than you two do. <laughs> so <laughs> I just do what these guys say. <laughs> on this one, they're both right. Yeah. <laughs> I would like to note something you said earlier in terms of the coordination among federal agencies. And one of the, one of the highlights I always like to, to suggest um, for this is that there is an orchestra leader. It is the US EPA, but they don't do it alone. And they help really work and try and coordinate um, the goals and activities of the other US federal agencies. And so from our perspective, you know, this is a model to get to the, to the, get to the issue that you raised earlier yeah. on fire and that we do think this, it's, it, is seem, it does seem to be working pretty well. And I think the GAO and other reports have, have, have borne that out. So I just wanted to point that out, that at least in this region, 
we are trying to address some of the problems that you address um, for other issues. Well, it's, an, it's a really important issue. I'll tell you that when I came to Congress 21 years ago, 20, and tw 20 years and two months ago, uh, for about four years before that, they'd been relicensing a couple of dams on the Snake River. Right. Still relicensing them. You got the Forest Service, you got the BLM, you got the EPA, you got all these agencies, and there's not one boss. And so consequently, all they do is fight. One agency thinks this, another agency thinks that, and consequently, it never gets done. It's taken these 24 years so far to relicense them, and they're not relicensed yet, and three times as much money as it did to build the dams. Right. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, that, that's one of the reasons why when Asian carp became a uh, topic here in Washington, D.C., that we worked really hard. I had some legislation to kind of coordinate and have and have one group, and we didn't do that alone. All the Great Lakes uh, legislators work, worked on that together. Could I ask you, gentlemen, just to comment uh, on on two things really quickly, um, uh, Mr. Lord? You you mentioned, you know, some of the the vibrance that has come along, especially in the Duluth St. Louis uh, St. Lewis River area right. with the cleanup. It meant, uh, talk about that for a second. And then talk about climate change because we hear a lot about climate change and, um, you know, people don't think of the, the fresh water of the Great Lakes. We've watched Lake Superior's level drastically go up and down. There's a new map uh, that was just in the um, uh, local... Uh, paper, it's the big paper uh, in, in Minnesota, just showing how Minnesota uh, could be prairie um, in, in a couple of decades, um, moving towards prairie. And how's that going to affect the Great Lakes? So if you could just, you know, maybe give us um, a minute on revitalization of the economy and a minute on climate change, because we're going to drill down into more on that. But people don't think of climate change affecting the Great Lakes and affecting right. our fresh drinking water. Right, yeah. So to start with Duluth, that is a really good story to tell because it does point to the partnerships that are created between the federal agencies like the US EPA and, and state and local partners. Um, Minnesota bonded for, I believe, $25 million, which they are applying to the cleanup project in the St. Louis area of concern, and they are moving forward with that work. They've already completed a number of projects, which has resulted in a number of new hotels. Um, in, in the Duluth area, um, and they have a number of projects. They have already identified the other projects lined up, and those projects are dependent upon additional federal resources, as I think you know. Um, and you know, once they get all that done, they will continue to see the increased recreational opportunities that are bringing tourism and other business opportunities um, to to the northern shore, um, that whole coastal area up there um, in, in Minnesota. So uh, it's a really great story to tell up and what's going on in Duluth. And in terms of climate change. Uh, you know, and I, as, as I think um, Mr. Lerner noted, uh, you know, they're going to have their report coming out in a couple of weeks. But what we have seen is that because of the changing hydrologic cycles, um, you know, the, the, the lakes have fluctuated over time. But people generally think that the, instead of the oceans rising, the lakes will decline over time. But not only that, the, the increased in, or the unpredictability of precipitation, the heavier rains happening at different times of the year, could all influence these harmful algal blooms, for example. So with heavier rains, you have greater runoff. Greater runoff could push more of those nutrients into our waterways, which could cause, and then with, combined with the heat that we would anticipate because of the cl changing climate, we could see even worse harmful algal blooms that we're already seeing. And not only worse, but in different places. I think even Lake Superior now we're beginning to see these HABs, um, which we haven't seen because Lake Superior generally has been too cold to <coughs> support them. And so we would expect that that kind of, those kinds of things would be likely to occur on a more and more frequent basis. Mr. Lerner? Yeah, on the climate change issue, we've convened leading, oops, thank you. We've convened some of the leading scientists from University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, Ohio State, University of Illinois, University of Michigan, Michigan State, Indiana, Purdue, to come together and do the first recent comprehensive assessment of the impact of climate change on the Great Lakes. And it deals with public health and infrastructure and fish and wildlife and the regional economy. We'll be releasing that report March 21st and we'll be glad to provide it to the committee, subcommittee members. 
uh, two key points on climate change with regard to the practical effects Mr. Lord was talking about. First of all, higher and wa lower water levels. Lower water levels mean marinas, intake valves, docks being stranded. Um, higher levels involve more flooding. What the science on this seems to be is that uh, the impact of climate change and more extreme weather is uh, more deviations from the norm, if you will. Summers in which water levels are much higher when there have been wetter winters and springs and much lower when it's relatively low in terms of precipitation in winter and spring and it's hot in the summer where there's more evaporation. What that means is all shoreline related activity is under a lot of stress. When it comes to the algae blooms, overall hotter temperatures in effect cook the nutrient runoffs, whether it's Lake Erie or Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, Green Bay, in the shallow water bays. Um, the science here is that climate change will exacerbate the algae bloom problems. Simply put, uh, when you're dealing with a shallow water bay with the relatively lower water levels and more phosphorus and nutrients mm -hmm. coming into the bay, the hotter temperatures cook the water, more evaporation, that leads to worse algae blooms. Climate change exacerbates the problem. Thank you, Mr. Drayson. I have our work cut out for us, <laughs> and, as well as the other regional um, uh, water bodies that this, that this committee funds. Thank you very much. You're Mr. welcome. Mr. Drayson, do you want to introduce the next panel? We appreciate your leadership and your support. I already introduced them once. You can do it again. <laughs> the next group, please uh, take your seats. Thank you. Our next group uh, is here, so we'll start in order as we try to at least stay close to schedule uh, and recognize uh, Ms. Casey White for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of the U.S. Geological Survey's budget on behalf of the Geological Society of America. GSA is a professional society of 22,000 members from across the globe with a mission to advance geoscience research and discovery, service to society, stewardship of the earth, and the geoscience profession. GSA applauds the work of this subcommittee to reject the cuts proposed to the USGS in the administration's fiscal year 18 and 19 budget and instead provide increases for the agency. We thank the committee for their recognition of the important work of the survey to protect lives, property, and national security. GSA asked Congress to provide USGS with $1.2 billion in appropriations for fiscal year 2020. GSA also asked Congress to ensure that any proposed changes to the organi organizational structure or location of the USGS and its staff are fully vetted to ensure that the changes support rather than hinder the ability of the USGS to serve the nation with its research and partnerships. The USGS is one of the nation's premier science agencies with a distinctive capacity to engage truly interdisciplinary teams of experts to gather data, conduct research, and develop integrated decision support tools about our Earth. In addition to underpinning the science activities and decisions of the many agencies within the Department of the Interior, this research is used by communities and businesses across the nation to make informed decisions regarding land use planning, emergency response, natural resource management, engineering, and education. Bipartisan congressional and executive branch support exists for USGS, as shown by the advancement of recent legislation, including the enactment of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program Reauthorization Act in December 2018. Soon the House will consider a lands package that includes a vault hazards and mapping title that would establish a national volcano early warning and monitoring system at the USGS, and reauthorize the USGS National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. USGS research addresses many of society's greatest challenges. For example, natural hazards, including earthquakes, hurricanes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and landslides, were a major cause of fatalities and economic losses in 2018. 
Decision makers in many sectors rely upon USGS data to respond to these natural disasters. For example, USGS volcano monitoring provides information to enable decisions that ensure aviation safety. The USGS network of stream gauges is used by the National Weather Service to issue flood and drought warnings. USGS Earth and space observations are necessary to predict severe space weather events, which affect the electric power grid, satellite communications, and space-based position, navigation, and timing systems. GSA urges Congress to support efforts for the USGS to modernize and upgrade its natural hazards monitoring and warning systems, including additional high-quality topographic and other mapping and earthquake early warning systems. In 2017, President Trump signed an executive order entitled A Federal Strategy to Ensure Secure and Reliable Supplies of Critical Materials that highlights the vulnerability created by the nation's reliance on foreign sources for many minerals. GSA supports increases in mineral science, research, information, data collection, and analysis. GSA appreciates congressional support for the new three-dimensional mapping and economic empowerment program, or 3DEEP, which will provide new resources and leverage current data by building upon the existing and successful 3D elevation mapping program and the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. USGS research on climate change is used by local policymakers and resource managers to make sound decisions based on the best possible science, including key USGS research on past changes to our climate. The Climate Adaptation Science Centers provide scientific information necessary to anticipate, monitor, and adapt to the effects of climate change at regional and local levels allowing communities to make smart, cost-effective decisions. For example, the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center recently supported the development of a new experimental tool on drought monitoring and warning called the Landscape Evaporative Response Index, adding to the USGS resources on understanding our ground and surface water. The Landsat satellites have amassed the largest archive of remotely sensed data in the world a tremendously important resource for natural resource exploration, land use planning, and assessing water resources, the impacts of natural disasters, and global agriculture. GSA supports interagency efforts to ensure the continuation of this vital monitoring. All of these important endeavors are supported by the core system <coughs> sciences, facilities, and science support, which provide critical information, data, and infrastructure to underpin this research. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the U.S. Geological Survey. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Appreciate it, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. Devlin. You're recognized for five minutes. Chair McCollum and Ranking Member Joyce, uh, good morning. I'm Dan Devlin. I'm a professor and director of the Kansas Water Resources Institute, located at Kansas State University. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the National Institutes of Water Resources in support of the Water Resources Research, Research Act program, a program funded as part of the U.S. Geological Survey's budget. I'd like to uh, start by thanking the subcommittee for its continued support for the Water Resources Research Act and request that the subcommittee fund the program in fiscal year 2020 at $10 million. The Water Resources Research Act, enacted in 1964, is designed to expand and provide more effective coordination of the nation's water research. The act establishes water resource, resources research institu institutes at lead universities in each state, as well as for the uh, District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Commonwealth of, Nor of the Northern Mariana Islands, and American Samoa. Congress created the institutes to fulfill three main objectives. First was to develop more, through research, new technology and more e efficient methods for resolving local, state, and national water resources challenges. Two, train water scientists and engineers through on-the-job participation and research. And three, facilitate water research coordination and application of research results through dissemination of information and technology transfers. Each, uh, since 1964, the institutes have fulfilled these objectives in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. Each institute has, is managed by a director in each state, generally at the land-grant university. Uh, the program is the only federally mandated research network that focuses on applied water resource research, education, training, and outreach. 
The institutes partner with universities, local governments, industry, non-governmental organizations to, to help solve a variety of regional water challenges. Uh, each state contributes a minimum of a two-to-one two to non-federal-to-federal match uh, of funds, thus ensuring that local and regional priorities are addressed and the impact of federal dollars is maximized. The uh, institutes also ensure coordination between state, regional, and national interest uh, by co collaborating with 150 state agencies, 180 federal agencies, and more than 165 local and municipal offices. The following are several examples of research conducted by institutes across the country. Uh, my institute, the Kansas Water Resources Institute, is an institute at Kansas State University. Research projects being funded help determine why and when conditions are right for harmful algal blooms to occur in surface water reservoirs. Researchers are assessing how different nutrient levels and forms affect the development of harmful algal blooms. And they're also developing models that will allow forecasting when conditions are favorable for harmful algal blooms to occur. Results of this work will help agencies predict harmful algal bloom formation and protect human health. Another example is at the Minnesota Water Resources Center, who is uh, supporting a team of researchers developing techniques for nearly continuous monitoring of over 12,000 Minnesota lakes using satellite imagery. Although Minnesota has a well-regarded water monitoring program, only a small fraction of the state's lakes are currently monitored on a regular basis. Uh, this, the new data will be high resolution and frequent for all lakes, allowing agencies to target field monitoring where needed while also providing new data to manage aquatic habitats. There are two grant components of the USGS Water Resources Research Institute's program. One is the state water research grants, which provide competitive seed opportunities for state institutes that allow us to focus on state, local, and community water resources. The other is the National Competitive Grants Program that focuses on issues between USGS and university scientists that, are, that focus on national priorities. For uh, FY 2020, the National Institutes of Water Resources recommends a subcommittee provide $10 million to the USGS for the Water Resources Research Institute program. Thank you on behalf of all the institute directors for the opportunity to testify and for the subcommittee's strong support of the Water Resources Research Program. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now we'll recognize uh, Mr. Palliatiello. Very good. Thank you. Correct. You have five minutes to address us. Thank, Thank you, uh, Mr. Joyce, Madam Chair. I'm John Palatiello, and it's my pleasure to speak to you today on behalf of the USGS 3DEP, or 3D Elevation Program. Uh, the 3DEP coalition is comprised of a broad cross-section of stakeholders, including over 35 organizations in surveying, mapping, geospatial, real estate, home building, flood management, emergency response, the environment, science, mining, insurance, telecom, agriculture, infrastructure, and others. What uh, this should give you a bit of uh, an insight into is the very broad uh, range of applications that the 3DEP program supports. Uh, 3DEP is satisfying a growing demand for consistent, high-quality topographic data across the country, as I said, to uh, meet a wide range of applications. Um, the USGS has identified more than 600 applications of the data uh, on that which has been collected to date. Uh, these have included uh, flood risk management, infrastructure, landslides and other hazards, uh, a variety of different water resources, both water supply and, um, and stormwater runoff, aviation safety, telecom, homeland security, emergency response, precision agriculture, energy, pipeline safety, climate, and many others. Um, the 3 dep data promotes economic growth, facilitates environmental, responsible environmental protection, resource development and management, um, and assists with infrastructure improvement and generally enhance the quality of life of all Americans. Um, I wanted to show you a couple of uh, USGS posters that give you an idea of, of how 3DEP is being, being used. 
This uh, coincidentally is in Minnesota. This is the Red River on the border between Minnesota and, um, and North Dakota. And it becomes a very effective tool for both um, preparedness and response with regard to floods. With regard to an infrastructure that Congress, an infrastructure program that Congress may um, <clears throat> take on, this becomes the underpinning for all infrastructure management. Uh, this, this data becomes part of <clears throat> the planning, the design, the construction, the operation, the maintenance of every piece of infrastructure. Um, to put LIDAR in layman's terms, uh, remember the, the pointers that we use in presentations. A LIDAR uh, sensor is basically one of those pointers that's sending millions of pulses per second to the ground. It knows the altitude of the airplane and it's measuring the time it takes for that pulse to hit the ground and register back up to the sensor. And as it goes along uh, from an aircraft, it's picking up that and picking up the, the height of the mountains and the depth of the valleys and gives you uh, a very modern uh, version of the old traditional USGS topographic maps. Um, the, the program was initiated with the vision of funding at $146 million per year. Uh, at that rate, the USGS estimated uh, in the study they did, uh, in partnership with the private sector, uh, that it could remap the country on an every seven year cycle. Uh, this is where we are thus far in the program that started in 2014. Uh, you can see by the um, uh, the light green is uh, through partnerships in 2018. Um, the lighter green is other forms of, li of LIDAR that may or may not meet the national standard that USGS seeks. The gray is, um, is lesser parts of, of LIDAR data that's available. I would note um, in particular Ohio and Minnesota. And, and particularly look at the public lands west. Uh, the USGS is virtually the only Interior Department agency that's contributing to this program. And so when you look at virtually every uh, interested party that will appear before you today and every program and activity in which they have an interest, LIDAR becomes the underpinning. It's the foundation data to all of the land management infrastructure and other applications that, um, that we'll be discussing today. There is a cooperative program. There are other agencies that are contributing to 3DEP, um, but it's still not meeting the 146 million. FEMA is the largest contributor because the data supports their flood mapping program, um, but that's not a consistent or reliable source of data from one year to the next. Um, in our view, this is not a program that should be funded by USGS going around and passing the hat. Uh, this is something that should be funded um, uh, for the, the um, interest of the country at large. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you for your uh, testimony, and we'll now hear from Mr. Barden. Good morning, Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce. I'm David Jonas Bardeen, and I very much appreciate the chance to appear in person as your witness on two issues involving USGS. Their geomagnetism program, which should be expanded, and the completion of the three-dimensional magnetotelluric survey, which was started by the National Science Foundation, but finished, their contribution was finished last year, and a group of agencies, the space weather agencies, collectively have decided that the appropriate manager of that program it was NSF in the past, ought to be USGS, but that depends on funding. So I'm here to talk on funding for both of those issues. Let me start by thanking you from the bottom of my heart for this subcommittee's actions, leadership, and the last two appropriation cycles as far as the USGS geomagnetism program. God bless you. Now, we're hoping that we'll see something different in the President's budget. When it comes, I just want to volunteer now to work with your ABLE staff on the details of that. But I think what I'm talking about today 
reflects a consensus of national policy, certainly on space weather and space weather prediction, as well as other related issues. I don't think there's anything partisan. I don't think there's anything particularistic. These agencies have gotten together. They have come to their decision as to what's the best way to do it, and I think that's what I'm advocating for. Your report last year, May, pointed out that the geomagnetism program of USGS is part of the U.S. National Space Weather Program, an interagency collaboration that includes programs in the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, the Department of Defense, the National Oceanograph Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the National Science Foundation. The program provides data to these agencies, to oil drilling service companies, to geophysical surveying companies, and to electric transmission utilities. My personal interest has been particularly with the electric power grid and protecting it from solar storm events on the one hand and the possibility, which we hope won't happen, of a high altitude nuclear explosion and the electromagnetic pulse that would result from that. The map at the end of my prepared testimony shows you where our USGS magnetic observatories are. And frankly, everybody who has looked at this knows there's a huge, huge gap. We don't have enough. Now, what is sufficient, we can discuss. But between Fredericksburg, Fredericksburg Virginia, and Boulder, Colorado, and the Stennis facility in Mississippi, we don't have anything. That's where most Americans live. And then we have to go to Canada, to the Ottawa station in northern Ontario to make up for it. We need more magnetic observatories. And we probably need other kinds of magnetometer stations. What was being provided by USGS is real time, 24 hours a day, accurate quality information, upgrading equipment, and it's used for all kinds of different things. Right? If there's time, ask me about the, the wandering North Magnetic Pole and, and, and that whole issue, which is not part of my prepared testimony. We need more stations. Right? I'm advocating take that 1.9 million, which has been in the line for geomagnetism program, and raise it to 4 million. Keep in mind when I'm saying that, that the Air Force has announced that it's going to withdraw, stop the 560,000 contribution, which has been came from their budget. So it's really not as much of an increase as I'm advocating as, advocating as it seems. But NOAA has responsibility for predicting space weather events for the civilian economy and the civilian agencies. The Air Force has it for the whole defense establishment. The loss of this money is a serious thing that I think your subcommittee ought to think about. Frankly, I don't really understand where the Air Force and the defense establishments are going to get the data that they're now getting from USGS, but that's a different question, and perhaps other subcommittees ought to look into that. Now, finally, on the ma ge geomagnetic survey, two-thirds of the country had been surveyed, one-third has not. Some of the extreme Hazard spots identified so far are in northern Minnesota, and that gets American Transmission Company interested and involved, and in southern Maine, that gets central Maine power involved. But the entire southern tier, for starting with the panhandle of Florida and all the way to most of California, and all of Texas and Oklahoma in between, we have no data. Now, there's a very exciting development and a high priority for improving the models that use these 3D magnetotelluric data. But it would be shocking if one-third of the country can't do it. NOAA has told this committee and the Senate Appropriations Committee that it won't be able to provide accurate forecasts of storm weather unless this survey is completed. Thank you. Thank you, and I certainly uh, appreciate your testimony today. 
And I apologize because I was not, uh, I was negligent in not telling you about the five minute limitation before we started this. Well, M Mac had warned me, I'm sorry. I apologize for exceeding. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, do you have any questions? Um, I do, but I can yield oh, to you. I always defer to the lady. Um, I've, th thank you both for, for your testimony and I've got it all marked up and we'll, we'll follow up, but I have a, I have a, a couple of questions on, on, on the mapping and because some, some of the um, things that um, you two gentlemen talked about are also occurring in other committees with, with mapping and, and you mentioned the Air Force. So I'm on the Department of uh, the, the DOD's uh, Appropriation Committee, so I'm gonna find out. Thank you for, I will, ta I will talk to the Air Force um, about what's, what's going on with that and this committee all looking because we have, to, we have to be frugal with every penny. So if there's some way we can use uh, open source information and make sure that it's shared, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that that, that, that happens. But you raise a good point about making sure that NOAA has the information it needs, but NOAA's kind of dot, dot, dot com to this committee. We that the science committee and there's funding in, a, in another appropriations committee, so we need, we need to talk to them. I would like to talk about um, um, uh, the, the LADAR uh, data for a second. Um, you were very brave to hold up a map basically showing Mr. Joyce and I having n nothing been scanned. So Ohio and Minnesota are big blanks on there. I'm not, I'm not gonna count the Red River Valley because I looked very carefully. It was more in the Fargo area. Um, but uh, so that, 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 that kind of leads me to just a general question about, you know, there, there were decisions that were made that all of Alaska has been mapped and that other states have been mapped. So one of the things that, um, you don't have to tell us why our states are blank. Maybe they're just perfect and they don't need to be mapped. But how are decisions being made? And I know there's other technologies out there kind of doing 3D. So what is unique about, can, can, can we get all the mapping done with another technology and then does LADAR have something like a little more unique where we need to pinpoint it and use it in certain occasions but for getting the overall mapping done? Are there other technologies that are out there? Um, first of all, great credit has to go to USGS that when they launched this program, they developed an executive committee across the federal government. And so there is participation from other agencies. Additionally, each year they go out with a broad agency announcement, a BAA, and it's basically an invitation for state and local government, other interested parties and stakeholders to submit proposals. Uh, for cost sharing and cooperative uh, mapping. When those requirements come in from the other agencies, from the state and local partners, that establishes the, this, the priorities. So um, I don't know whether Minnesota or Ohio have submitted proposals under the BAA or not, but what this map shows is the work, uh, the, the progress of work based on that cooperative strategic approach and the input from the different constituent and participating agencies. So, so the Department of Agriculture and, and others, and uh, we need FEMA. to feed out how much of the bill that they're footing versus what we're, we're footing um, on, on there because you and I both know we have a lot of um, pressures on the few dollars that, 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 we, that we do have. Um, how much, um, so LADAR is done by plane, there's satellites, so what's the difference in, in cost, cost between the two? It's, there's always a trade-off between the scale and resolution of the mapping and the altitude of the sensor that you're using. So LIDAR is much more effective than satellite imagery because you can get at a much higher resolution, much better scale of mapping. And what the 3DEP program uh, did when the USGS started to investigate this is they, they, again, reached out to all the stakeholders and said, what is the common denominator of data quality, of scale and resolution, that would meet the greatest number of users and requirements? And those were the standards that they established for 3DEP. Um, there is a different sensor called IFSAR that's used for Alaska, and that's because of the terrain and the weather and the difficulty in uh, capturing that kind of data. So the IFSAR is flown at a much higher altitude, um, but that's the only exception. The rest of the country has, the goal is a very consistent 
data set across the entirety of the country. So when you look at conventional photogrammetry, which is mapping from aerial photographs, when you look at remote sensing satellite imagery, when you look at all of the different types of sensors and type of mapping that can be done, the conclusion that USGS and its partners came to was LIDAR uh, at a consistent uh, standard is the optimal solution for the country. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Joyce, I think um, what I'd like to do is, you know, we need, we need to figure out, we need to talk to USGS and figure out what we need for our committee and being partners with, with other agencies, but that everybody is contributing um, to it because in the, the increases um, that are talking about being needed, um, we need to make sure we're getting the biggest bang out of, out of that dollar for our committee and that we're not, uh, you know, helping out others. And I also think we need to maybe bring in the DOD with uh, USGS and, and see if there's, if there's, if there's a blend. Um, and I'm going to be um, asking them how much uh, LADAR uh, is the cost of producing um, on, a, on a square mile basis versus some of these others to hone down. I'm not saying LADAR is invaluable, but we need to hone down and make sure that this committee's funding for what, what we're getting out of it and that the other committees, whether it uh, be uh, FEMA or the rest, that, that they are paying their fair share. So um, Any help thank that you, you can uh, lend towards, uh, our goal is the, is the GS number of 146 million. Um, obviously, if you can fund the entirety of that in your bill, we would be delighted. But if that, if we can get to 146 million with Can't. contributions from different agencies, uh, we would be happy with that as well. Well, there, so there was discussion when I was first on this committee of taking some of it totally out. So um, I, I want to make sure that we're cost effective and getting the mapping that USGS needs. Thank so you. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Joyce. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm, the longer I sit here, the more I'm rising in this committee. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you all. Today is public information. It's all co-equal. <laughs> well, thank you all for your, uh, the opportunity for, to listen to the things that you have to say and to hear from you directly about the resources necessary to continue to do the great work you're doing. Thank you. Could you, could you tell me just one half minute? I, I can, we are, no, we okay. are, I am like, we were supposed to be done. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another panel. Thank you very much, though, Thank you sir. Very much. Um, if Mr. Cassidy uh, for uh, the National Trust for Prehistoric Preservation, uh, Jim Leitenzer, Leitenzer, Leitenheiser, Leitenheiser, Leitenheiser. Boy, you've got that down, Mr. Joyce. Ameri from your district. <laughs> well, you sh American Battlefield Trust and uh, uh, Sarah uh, Carpin from uh, the National uh, uh, Alliance of. Uh, National Heritage Areas. So we'll first hear from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So if you'd introduce yourself um, for the record, please. Thank you, Chair McCollum. Also, Ranking Member Joyce. I appreciate it. Microphone on. It's a little yes, now it's light. red. Okay. Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to present the National Trust for Historic Preservation's recommendation for FY20 appropriations. My name is Tom Cassidy. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations. The National Trust is a privately funded nonprofit organization chartered by Congress in 1949. The most important words that I can convey to the subcommittee are thank you. Um, in recent years, the subcommittee has made significant investments in key programs that bring our shared history to life and also investments that ensure the story of all Americans are told. I will focus on only a few pro programs addressed in my testimony. First, the Historic Preservation Fund is the principal source of funding to implement the nation's historic preservation programs. The Trust is enormously appreciative of last year's historic funding level of $102.6 million. The remarkable growth in HPF funding over recent years has largely been because of increases in competitive grant programs. And thank you, Chair McCollum, for your leadership in reviving the Save America's Treasures program. Um, I'd also like to draw attention to three other HPF programs. The first is the smallest 
it is, we are recommending a million dollars for competitive grants for the survey and nomination of properties associated with communities that are currently underrepresented on the National Register and the National Historic Landmarks. The committees began funding this program in FY15 at a half a million dollars a year when less than 8% of National Register <coughs> and NHLs included communities considered underrepresented, including African American, Latino, Latino Native Americans, and women. Um, the program has been successful. For example, in FY15, the Minnesota Historic Society received a grant for $60,000 to expand the stories told at Fort Snelling, um, to include not only military history, but also significant stories about Native Americans, African Americans, and Japanese Americans, including the enslavement of Dred Scott uh, to an Army officer back in the 1830s. Second, working with Congressman Clyburn and Congresswoman Terry Sewell, we are recommending an enhancement and expansion of the successful African-American Civil Rights Program, which was funded last year at $14.5 million, to an expanded underrepresented community civil rights program funded at $30 million uh, to ensure that we have grants for sites important to civil rights for all Americans. And the third, coming, uh, um, and the third would be for, would be a new $5 million program of competitive grants to state and tribal historic preservation officers to invest in 21st century GIS mapping and digitization of historic resources. As we see a tsunami of pressure rising to um, promote infrastructure, such an investment would improve the identification of historic resources at the very earliest stages of project planning leading both to the protection of historic sites and also promoting more efficient delivery of infrastructure projects. We are also enormously appreciative of, these, of the committee's commitment to the deferred maintenance needs of the National Park Service, um, including the repair and rehabilitation and cyclic maintenance programs. In 2019, these two accounts received $110 million over FY15 levels, an increase of 62%. We urge the committee to continue these investments, just as we also work to secure a dedicated funding source, as provided in the Bipartisan Restore and Public Lands Act. We're grateful for the introduction of this by uh, Representatives Kilmer and Bishop, and the co-sponsorship of the chair and other members of the subcommittee. It's also related to mapping, actually. Um, and in part because if you don't map it, you can't save it. And we recommend $20 million for the Bureau of Land Management's Cultural Resource uh, Management Program, an increase of $3 million over enacted levels. The BLM oversees, it's nowhere near Minnesota, nor Ohio, but it oversees the, most, the largest, most diverse, and importantly, scientifically important collection of historic and cultural resources on federal lands. Increased funding would also support updated predictive modeling and data analysis to increase oh, the BLM's ability to have um, large-scale planning. And if I had another 50 seconds, I would say, believe whatever this man says. I used to vote for him <laughs> and fund his requests. <laughs> That's pretty good endorsement. <laughs> it did that, sure. Happy to have you sir, uh, here uh, today, sir, to talk about the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Ranking Member Joyce and University of Dayton graduate, I might add, we went to the same school about 60 years apart. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, he got rich and famous. And I, Anyway, I'm president of the American Battlefield Trust, and it's a it's an honor to be here and a pleasure. I, just two messages. One, thank you. Uh, starting in 1998, the United States Congress made a decision, then an earmark, now an authorized program, to fund the Battlefield Land Acquisition Grant Program. And what it is is it requires, um, it's authorized at $10 million, and you all in the last four years have funded at $10 million. It, it authorizes the purchase of 
Civil War, Revolutionary War, and War of 1812 battlefield acquisition by way of a federal dollar for every dollar. It has to be matched by a dollar from someplace else, usually the private sector. It's been an incredibly efficient program. Uh, I can't think of another one as far as land acquisition goes where the federal government uh, gets a better bang for their buck because every federal dollar has to be matched by a dollar and it usually ends up being two, three, four dollars. The land that is saved, acquired, uh, does not become the property of the United States government, so you don't have to maintain it. So there's another uh, bonus to it. It's strictly from willing sellers. It's a competitive program. It's administered by the National Park Service. And it's allowed us to save over 32,000 acres uh, of American heritage. And if you buy the idea that place-based teaching is important, specifically going to the taking people to the places where American history was created, where this country was created and defined, uh, it's been a remarkable program. And so I thank you for the wisdom that Congress has shown in funding it as much as they have over the years and ask that you respectfully ask you consider full funding this time, as you have the last four years. Thank you. Um, Ms. Capen from the Alliance of the National Heritage Areas. Good morning. Um, my name is Sarah Capen. I'm the director of the Niagara Falls National Heritage Area and the chair of the Alliance of National Heritage Areas, which is an organization that rep represents the vast majority of authorized national heritage areas. National heritage areas are funded through the National Recreation and Preservation Account and represent considerably less than 1% of the total National Park Service budget. I'd like to begin by just thanking this committee for supporting the National Heritage Area Program for the past several years. The National Heritage Area Program is one of the Department of the Interior's most cost-effective initiatives, relying on a public-private partnership in which every federal dollar is matched with an average of $5.50 in other public and private funding, very similar to my colleague next to me. Often that match to the federal investment comes from the contribution of volunteers who commit their time and expertise within individual national heritage areas to support our programs, maintain trails, and assist with community conservation projects. In 2017 alone, national heritage areas benefited from over 38,000 volunteers, contributing over 800,000 hours for heritage area projects, which was roughly a $19 million value. We're designated by Congress. National heritage areas are lived in landscapes that tell nationally important stories that honor our nation's diverse heritage through shared resources, partnerships, and direct community involvement. National heritage areas are catalysts in our communities. They're often located in vulnerable communities who have suffered economic setbacks due to declining industries. Utilizing a grassroots community-driven approach, NHAs work with these communities to build a new economic platform based on heritage tourism and outdoor recreation that revitalizes the, the economy and instills pride for the people who live there. What makes National Heritage Areas different from other programs is that people and partners who live within NHAs are the key participants in the decision-making process. We work directly with the people who live in the communities. National Heritage Areas have direct impact and involvement with communities like Akron, Ohio, and Muscle Shoals, Alabama, bringing the National Park Service mission out from behind the enclaves of federal lands and directly to the people. Few federal programs epitomize the democratic principles our nation was built on, like National Heritage Areas. National Heritage Areas truly are of the people, by the people, and for the people. In addition to fostering collaboration within National Heritage Areas, National Heritage Areas often collaborate with each other to address shared history, or collaborative landscape conservation, and we work with our partners who are at the table today. An example of this is the participation by a majority of national heritage areas in Operation Pollination, which actually began in the Midwest, which works with volunteers, schools, and partners in our communities to address declining pollinating, pollinator populations through pledge supports that raise awareness, commitment, and engagement to the issue. The result of this multi-regional collaboration will be focused attention on the pollinator crisis in hundreds of communities across the United States. While the Heritage Area Program currently models the type of efficiency we need to see in more federal programs, we believe it can be modernized to better ensure long-term sustainability and savings. 
As the attached chart demonstrates, funding levels have not kept pace with the growth and popularity of the program. And the chart explains it all right there. Um, so while we increased by 100%, um, our funding has not. It's actually been less than 50%. This has resulted in significant underfunding of the program to individual national heritage areas. It should be noted that just recently the Senate passed the S-47, which added six new national heritage areas. Um, and this is going to further exasperate an already underfunded program. <laughs> to bring appropriations into alignment with the number of congressionally authorized national heritage areas, we're re just respectively requesting an increase in funding to $32 million. In closing, I hope that this committee um, will further support our great work that we're doing in communities across the United States. Thank you. Mr. Juarez. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you all for being here today and what you do, and uh, certainly appreciate my fellow flyer and the work that he's done, as well as a constituent. Are you still in? Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to thank you for being here, Ms. Capon. The Ohio and Erie Canal Way National Heritage Area helps preserve the trails and towns that sprung up along the Ohio and Erie Canal in the 19th and 20th century, promotes outdoor recreation, and supports local jobs and economic t opportunities in Northeast Ohio. Since receiving its National Heritage designation in 1996, the Ohio and Erie Canal Way have leveraged more than $350 million in federal, state, local, and private investments. Those of us in Congress should promote public-private initiatives like the National Heritage Area Program, and I will continue to work with my colleagues to support this program and appreciate your testifying before this com subcommittee today. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I know there's been a lot of interest about uh, uh, doing a heritage trail um, on the St. Croix. Um, we need a little more interest in Wisconsin. Um, so um, we're, anything you can do to help us out with that would be great. <laughs> um, uh, Mr. Cassidy, um, you, your, you, your testimony at the end just kind of took everything and just kind of brought it together from national parks to just everything, deferred maintenance. A lot of things that uh, we'll be we'll be talking about uh, more in this committee, but um, I would like you to touch on uh, just for uh, a minute on the international um, yes. uh, component of and why why that's important, why this committee should be paying attention to it. If you would please. So, world heritage sites are sites around the planet that recognize. Um, Boy, coming back into my memory volunteer, sites of, of, of universal human value. Many of them are natural, others are historic, such as Independence Hall, um, Monticello, uh, Statue of Liberty, and the National Park Service uh, Office of International Affairs funds the U.S. participation in this program. We were one of the leaders initially when it was started. So right now there are nominations moving forward that the Park Service should be shepherding for um, World Heritage designations that would support such things as Frank Lloyd Wright homes or civil rights or in, um, Hopewell Culture Indian Mounds in the Ohio River Valley. So the administration has um, proposed very drastic cuts to this program last year. The committees rejected that, um, and we would hope that you do that again this year. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, and thank you for being so patient and, and, and waiting because we were running late. So thank you all very much for your testimony. Um, Mr. Joyce, uh, we'll be in recess until uh, 1245. Uh, and uh, with that, I thank everyone. Thank you. Good man. <laughs> well, he's got his battlefield hat on. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to leave. I can just leave this. Okay. I guess so. Hi, how you doing? Good to see you as well.